This is the Sons of UCF podcast, your place for UCF sports talk year-round. Now, here is Adam and Mike. All right, welcome back to the Sons of UCF show. This is the uh, 137th episode. My name is Adam, and as always, I have my good friend and yours, Mr. UCF Mike, back for yet another week. Mike, greetings, and how are you, my friend? Tremendous. I'm doing tremendously. Um, I, I think every. I think I start off with fantastic 90% of the time, so I'm going to try to come up with some new adjectives of how I'm doing every week. Okay. This week is tremendous. I'm open to subjection, uh, suggestions. And and whatever the other word was, too. Yeah, I mean, uh, it, it's funny. Like, I don't mean to start the show off this way every week, but somehow it just kind of happened, and now it's kind of like our thing. And I'm not even sure I really like it, but uh, what are you going to do? Either way, uh, you welcome 137th edition of the Suns UCF. We appreciate you for tuning in, however you're doing so. By the way, we're available on all of the high-quality podcast platforms, so find your favorite and make sure you subscribe or follow whatever it is you're doing now on these these silly podcast platforms. And while you're following things, make sure you're following us on all the social media stuff. That's at Sons of UCF on Facebook, on Twitter, on Instagram, on YouTube. You can also follow Mike on Twitter at UCF Mike one. Don't forget to subscribe to our YouTube channel. You'll find a lot of cool stuff there and the all new two nights media.com, which will at some point be our one-stop shop for everything UCF content related right now, which is archived all of our old shows including the Sons of UCF Live, which comes each and every Thursday live on the internet. Mike, I think I have all the plugs in there. Did I miss anything? Uh, not that I can tell. I think somebody's getting murdered in my house right now. It's kind of distracting. Okay. <laughs> a lot of screams going on inside. Okay. Um, do we need to, do you need to yeah, check on that? Should we, do we hit a pause here? Do you need to check on that, or do you think we're going to be good? No, nah, as long as nobody comes crawling into the garage anytime soon, I think we're okay. okay. Did you see any suspicious characters, any nefarious characters uh, scoping your house earlier? No. Uh, there's three of them that live here, and then mm-hmm. four, I guess, going caught the dog. Mm-hmm. It's probably uh, some kind of, you know, I don't know what's going on in there. Okay. Well, we're going <laughs> to need an update. Yeah, we're going to need an update at some point during the show. So when, whenever we hit uh, stop on this recording, I'm going to need an update from you. On, uh, on what's happening, Mike. But let's update everybody on the show this week. How of the week will cl- uh, close out as always, so you'll enjoy that. Uh, we're going to do a Big Three Father's Day edition, so Big Three Fathers and Sons. See what we did there? Stay tuned for that. Uh, and we've got some headlines here right off the top. We'll do a charge on, charge off style. In our interview this week, we're going back to the vault. Uh, so if you haven't heard it, it's new to you. One of the very uh, early interviews we did, Mike, and a groundbreaking interview for us here at the Sons of UCF because it was during this interview that we learned a little bit about something called the White Horse, which for several months became our mission to uh, to learn more and more and more about that. And it's probably one of the hallmark things that we've ever done on this show is introduce the White Horse to the UCF fan lexicon. And the man who brought us that White Horse, Mr. Justin Holman, is our, uh, our, our throwback interview guest for this week. So he appeared back, Mike, episode, I think it was 24 or 25, somewhere in there. Uh, so it's been probably two two plus years, uh, but uh, a good conversation with Justin, and uh, again one of the one of the seminal moments of the Sons of UCF show. That's right. We made news. I think that was the first time we discovered something in UCF land that nobody had ever heard before, and it was a big deal to us back then. It's still a big deal now. We still talk about it all the time. So if you haven't heard the interview yet, you'll learn about it as you go on. All right, so that's what's happening here tonight, Mike. Let's just start off right off the top. We'll do we'll do some headlines, uh, news and notes, but we'll do a charge on, charge off style. So for those who aren't familiar, I'm going to read Mike a phrase here, uh, and then he's going to tell me whether or not he agrees with my uh, my question, my premise, which is charge on, or he disagrees, which obviously would be charge off, Mike. So the biggest thing probably happening in UCF land, at least on campus, Mike, is the continuation of high school Kids flocking to Orlando to visit the campus, both officially and unofficially. I've seen Gus Malzahn pointing at more people than I can probably count. I've seen more people wearing the Citronaut uniform and uh, and and talking about their offers they've received. I've seen uh, T. Will rapping in the locker room. I've seen a bunch of awkward pictures with kids in shorts spinning footballs and whatnot, Mike, which can only mean that recruiting is here. And recruiting picked up a little bit, maybe, for UCF this week. Uh, so off of uh, Bounce House Weekend and all that stuff, two new commits have come in, Mike. Tyler Griffin, he's a three-star, six-foot-four wide receiver from Texas. And Jamal Johnson, a three-star, 250-pound uh, D-tackle, former commit to Miami. 
He's from right down there in your neck of the woods, uh, Hollywood, Florida, at Chaminade Madonna, Mike. So uh, after all the hype, all of Bounce House Weekend, all of these new graphics, everything we've been doing, Mike, after all that, only having two guys commit so far is a failure. Charge on or charge off? Charge off. I, think, I still think it's a little too early to be grading this the recruiting class. We're only a couple weeks in. Um, you, tell me how many commits does Alabama have right now? I, oh, I don't Jesus. know the answer to it. Yeah, neither do I. <laughs> <laughs> how, how, many, how many commits? To, okay, other teams in our conference like Cincinnati and the Cows, how are they all doing? Is everybody else racking up 10, 20 commits that I don't know about and we're stuck at two? If that's the case, then maybe we should be concerned. I don't think that is the case. So I'm not worried yet. We're going after some pretty big fish in this recruiting class. It's going to take a little patience. It's going to take maybe a couple more visits. Some of these kids, like I mentioned last week, they were just here unofficially. They're still going to take their official visits. They're going to still come during the season and watch a game live with a packed house. So I think that's going to make a big difference in their decisions. Um, I'm not worried at all. Right now, too, I'm, I'm hearing that this week we're probably going to get another boom or two. So that will be three or four. And we keep that pace going over the next month or two. We'll have 10, 15 commits just like we should. And we already have two other guys committed. Uh, Castellanos and Maldano have both already committed. So uh, so that's already two that are in the bag. Plus, what I what I don't know that we really know, Mike, is the impact that the transfer portal stuff will have on our, on our commits. Are we borrowing from future year scholarships? How many of those do we need? I know there's some speculation. You can do the math on what that might look like, but I don't know that we have that definitively figured out. So that's another factor. And and you're right. I don't know who's really cleaning up. If you think about it for college kids and in the first 15 months, they haven't been able to be on campus unless you're Arizona State, apparently. Uh, you haven't been allowed to have anybody on campus. So kids are taking their visits. Kids are going places. Obviously, UCF is getting their name out there. Uh, I read today, Mike, there was a recruit. Um, his name escapes me, but he was scheduled to go see Florida this past week, and he's canceled that visit now. And instead, it will come to visit UCF. And so you got to like some of the inroads that we're making. Uh, on the live show, we had Ryan Schneider on. He talked about how UCF's doing it right at camp, uh, how it was organized, how it was well put together, how Malzahn and the staff uh, were doing a great job uh, at, uh, at teaching these kids and making connections and making relationships. So while you can look at two and go, hey, this is ridiculous. Why aren't we just r- uh, racking in the guys? Um, I think this may be a situation where just a little bit of patience is needed. And again, while the 2022 class may be interesting, you, you, you know, Gus has to build for 23 and 24 and beyond. So I'm going to agree with you. I think this is a charge off moment. I can understand a little bit of the impatience, but I also think it's just that it's impatience. We've been on such a, a fast paced trajectory the last couple of months with everything that's gone on. that it's only natural for us to assume that we'll continue to, you know, at this breakneck speed and get everything we want. And the reality is at some point things will settle in, things will normalize. I think while while I'd love to have a few more booms on the board, some of these kids have already announced but aren't officially announcing if that makes sense. And and so there's timing issues, there's other things that have to be worked out. So I'm gonna charge off on this one for right now, Mike, but I can understand there may be some people who who are a little uncomfortable that we haven't seen more just yet. All right. We could have fifteen commitments right now. It really doesn't mean anything until they actually sign the paper. It's like in Seinfeld. We can take all the reservations we want right now. It's holding the reservations is the important thing. So uh, right now only two, that's uh, fine. By next week, like I said, we have four and then we build from there. As long as when it comes to signing day, the kids that commit actually do sign the paper and, and do come here. That's the most important thing right now. I'm not worried if we were getting shut out right now, maybe I'd be a little concerned. That's not the case. So, you know, take it as it goes. Plus, if we put W's on the board uh, and, and we're winning games and we're in the mix for uh, for bowl games and, uh, you know, we're out there, plus what Gus is doing, plus some of the stuff we've done at facilities, plus the relationships he's built. I mean, that's that's going to be a recipe for winning at some point. And so you're, you're right. Nothing's official until ink hits paper uh, or until paper hits fax machine these days, I guess is how that works out. Uh, so when when that happens is when we can really be excited. But uh, if we start getting W's on the board, Mike, we start off with a good win at Boise. We go and we beat uh, Louisville, you know, and our schedule starts rolling. Uh, you know, I think you factor that in as well. Um, you know, right now it's, it's really early, but, you know, people like winning. Uh, winning excitement and, and Gus Malzahn facilities, you know, community, high school relationships. And then all of a sudden we may have a powder keg on our hands, Mike, a powder keg. <laughs> and not all the kids that were here for Bounce House Weekend are kids that are going to college next year. Some of them are not for another two years down the road. We see kids that have been visiting that are only sophomores. And then we gave out a couple 
um, offers to sophomore quarterbacks, including one from our alma mater at Cardinal Gibbons. I think he's still got two years to play in high school. I don't think he's actually even – well, I know that for Gibbons, he hasn't uh, started a game at quarterback yet. And here he is with already a, uh, an offer. So still a lot to be seen out of these kids. A year or two down the road, at least we're building the relationships now. And Gus knows what he's doing. So, you know, I have full confidence in Gus and the staff. We'll have the class filled up by the time signing day comes around. All right, so we charge off on that one. Uh, we'll get back to football in just a second, Mike. Let's get p- probably to the second biggest sports story of UCF over the weekend, and that is uh, a good friend of our program, Renaya Jones, Mike, who was up in Oregon, and she was um, she was battling to potentially make the Olympic team in the 100-meter uh, uh, hurdles uh, on the track and field circuit and uh, had, had a good showing uh, initially got ourselves into the semifinals, Mike, but unfortunately came up just a bit short, ran a 12.68. That's good for 10th overall. Unfortunately uh, that did not qualify her for the final heat and thus uh, ends uh, her potential for Olympic uh, Olympic dreams here. However, she's just a, a, a freshman, at least in terms of her eligibility at UCF, Mike. Uh, and obviously she had a fantastic showing. I read someplace earlier that she even you know, quote tweeted this, that essentially she ran a 13 something, um, you know, her first uh, uh, match this year, first meet this year and she finished with a personal best 12 6 8 that's 0.72 difference from a time perspective in just one year that's huge in track and field and again obviously she's only uh you know uh, in terms of a an actual uh um you know academic area she's a sophomore but in terms of athletics she's still kind of competing as a freshman so she's got plenty of room to grow mike so here's my charge on charge off for you despite finishing fifth and missing the final rounds renaya jones just might have the biggest upside of any athlete at UCF charge on or charge off. I think I might have to charge on with this one. She's still young enough where by the time the next Olympics comes around, she should be in her prime. And if that's the case and she makes the Olympics and is one of the top competitors winning gold medals, uh, it doesn't really get much bigger than that for, for an amateur athlete. Now you want to tell me somebody on the football team's going to go out and have a stellar NFL career. I could buy that too. But which guy? You gotta tell me which one right now. Sometimes you don't know that while they're in college. I mean, some guys that had the best uh, NFL careers didn't have the greatest high school uh, college careers. Brandon Marshall was good at UCF. He wasn't anything spectacular. He had his best games the last couple of weeks, and then he went on to have a great career. Um, Asante Samuel was very good, but he wasn't what he was in the NFL, where he was returning an uh, interception for a touchdown seemingly every week and winning championships. So. Um, you know, I think she's got the potential. She's got the potential to be the best athlete or make the biggest name for herself, especially in the big stage like the Olympics. She didn't make it this time around, but 20, what is it? 2020. Well, how are they going to do it? 2024, I think. Yeah. Next one. Yep. So it's only really three years away, you know? So she's got a shot. I, I, I like where she sits right now. Well, plus I think they have like the, uh, you know, the track and field, uh, at least the, the U S um, uh, competitions every year or so, um, or, or every couple of years. So she still could become a U.S. champion or, or a U.S. Um, you know, record holder, if you will, uh, in between uh, now and the next Olympics. So that is a still a possibility, but it's interesting. You fell for the wording of my question. Like I said, biggest upside. And that's where I was interested in to, to see how you would take this because, one could argue what is upside. You mentioned uh, you mentioned football. There's obviously basketball. There's baseball, right, Mike? You know this being a baseball fan. If we have one guy out of the bullpen that's left-handed that has a rubber arm, you know he can get to the big leagues at some point and make a you know make a boatload of money and pitch every six days and get out two hitters a you know two hitters a, a night and be you know supremely wealthy. Where track and field is obviously not going to be a revenue-producing sport from that perspective. So upside is an interesting word here. I think if you think about it in terms of uh, who has the potential to maybe get the the best or the biggest accolades, having a gold medal as an option in front of you is is a pretty uh, pretty damn cool thing. Uh, some guys may be able to hang on and make some money in a league someplace, and you know the the third left tackle or the backup shooting guard or the you know the the second string catcher. Uh, but in, in none of those guys, none of those folks will be going for an opportunity to get a gold medal. The only other name I wrote down was Gabriel DeCamps. He's the the men's tennis player who, who's pretty solid. I don't know what his his prospects are after UCF. Obviously, the the men's tennis tour is, is quite competitive, um, and and you know there's definitely a lot of uh, a, a lot of uh, players uh, internationally that that could get in the way of, of his his success and how he plays. But I do think I, I think I have to agree with this because I can't think of another name of somebody who I say, hey, this guy is going to be the next one 
Dylan Gabriel is probably a name people are going to mention. Uh, but, but Mike, we'll, we'll see where that pans out. I mean, obviously, he's, he's undersized from a quarterback standpoint. Uh, he's got a great arm. He, he's definitely got a good touch and accuracy. But, you know, is he going to be the, the – uh, one of the highest paid NFL quarterbacks and lead a team to championships. I don't know. Uh, but it seems like Renai at least has a path forward that you can see pretty clearly here, no pun intended. So I think this is a charge on that she may just have the biggest upside of any athlete right now at UCF. All right, Renai controls her own destiny and her sport is just her. So it's not like Dylan Gabriel, who's relying on receivers and staying healthy. It's a lot harder to stay healthy playing football. And everything's got to kind of break your way, especially coming from a school in the American. He may not get picked as high as he should because of his conference and things like that. Whereas Renaya, I mean, it's just this fat. If you run faster than everybody else, they can't deny you anything, you know. And she's got an open competition against everybody. She's getting a fair shake. She was able to compete this time around. Didn't quite make it, but was very close. And if she keeps shaving time off like she did from the beginning of this season, then I don't see anything that can stop her. Yeah, and while she may not be able to have the most financially lucrative uh, type of professional career, I do think that the path to a gold medal is pretty cool, Mike. So I think we both agree we're not the biggest upside at uh, at UCF right now. Let's, uh, let's go back to football and a guy who had uh, some big upside while he was at UCF and an update on where he's at now. Mike, Greg McRae today was announced, signed with the Toronto Argonauts, of the CFL. So he went undrafted in the NFL. Didn't even really hear much about him getting camp invites, things like that. Uh, so he latches on with the Argonauts of the CFL. For for those who forget, the CFL did not play last season, so no games played last season for the CFL. Uh, so Greg will go up there. I'm not sure if this is a tryout or this is an official uh, you know, situation where he's on the roster. I guess we'll, we'll, we'll see after that uh, how that works out. Uh, but Mike, despite not being drafted, you still think Greg McRae made the right move by going pro? Charge on or charge off? I will charge on. Um, you know, obviously he, he did find a job. He wasn't in the NFL, but the NFL is hard to crack. You think if he came back for one more year, he would have got drafted? I think it might have even been harder. I mean, he's going to be a year older. He would have already been in college for since, what, 2016, basically? So I, I think the older you get, especially at a, a position like running back, it's harder for you to break into the NFL. They count all the hits you've been taking. So I think he had to go after this past season. He went, he, tr- he tried the NFL, didn't quite work. But, you know, the CFL is, is a nice landing spot. And do you know what the heck an Argonaut is? Is it anything like a Citronaut? Are they related <laughs> somehow? Is there Are there any similarities? It's funny. I think we asked Justin Holman a question about this because he played Canadian football. I think I asked him what an Alouette was, um, if I remember the, cor- the interview correctly. Um, let me check out an Argonauts here. Um, I'm Googling. They were a band of heroes in Greek mythology. Um, their name comes from the ship Argo, back, uh, named after its builder Argus. I don't know if that's any direction, uh, a connection rather to the uh, Toronto team. <laughs> All right. And uh, we can just say go nuts, right? And McCray's used to that. Already being a Citronaut down here. So uh, good for him. I, and we've had plenty of guys have success in, in Canadian football. Joe Burnett's had a, a nice career up there, a bunch of other guys. So if you go up there, you can get paid to play football. The only thing I don't like about the Canadian League this year, I think they're playing right at the same time as the NFL, where usually their season, I think, starts afterwards. I think because they sit out, sat out a year, they are basically going at the same time, which uh, may hurt some visibility and – I, get, I mean, I've never watched a Canadian football game myself, but the people <laughs> that do choose to watch it may not be watching it because they'll be watching the NFL. Yeah, plus I think there's a rumors at some point they're going to merge with the XFL, which was bought by The Rock. I don't know when that's happening, but there's some sort of a partnership alliance on that one, Mike. I really debated this one, and the only reason I did I debated it is it, everything you said makes perfect sense. As a running back, the, the older you get, the more hits on your body, uh, the less attractive you become from a professional standpoint. So all of that makes total sense. The only reason I consider maybe Greg coming back, and he would have had to have had a crystal ball to know what was going to happen with Heupel and the hiring of Malzahn. But Malzahn's offense is he's, he's obviously known for producing some pretty darn good running backs in his time. Um, and so with a different style, I feel like McCray and, and all the running backs really kind of got lost in the offensive shuffle because – we were known as a passing school, an air attack, high flying down the sideline, you know, Dylan Gabriel got all the, all the pub. But the reality was our, our running back tandems are, are largely some of the, some of the reasons we stayed in those games and some of the reasons we had big plays. Um, and, and so 
I would have loved to have seen what McCray could have done under a bit of a different system, under a Gus Malzahn style system, where again, he's had some success with the running backs. You know, UCF's going to be on TV a bunch this year. Malzahn's going to get a lot of eyeballs to UCF. You know, it probably would have been uh, Greg's ball, if you will. Um, I'm sure Ventavious and, and Mark Anthony Richards and Isaiah Bowser would have something to say about that. But I feel like Greg would have had first chance at, at the ball on this one. Um, so with all the eyeballs on him, would it have gotten him another opportunity at the NFL? Would he have gotten a different uh, a different crack at it? It's the only reason I, I, I think that maybe he should have come back, but he would have had to have known all of that stuff going into it. It's really unfair for, for us to say, hey, you should have done all that because none of that stuff is even possible. So it's probably, to your point, the smartest move to, to go out. But I think there's a, a good chance if he stays, Mike, maybe he gets a little bit of a different look. Um, but again, he would have had to be Nostro freaking Damas to know that uh, this was all going to go down at UCF. All right. And I got to see more from Elizabeth. What kind of running backs he uses? I think he prefers a bigger type of back. Yeah. McCray is not really the, the biggest size. So who knows how he would have fit in. Um, but he he put together one of the best single seasons we've seen at the running back position. In 2018, he was unstoppable, man. And he had, he had a fantastic season. He would break long runs. He'd get you that touchdown every time you needed it. So I loved watching him play. Very patient runner. And – Hopefully the guys this year are ready to take over for him. But and I wish him the best. I hope he has a nice career up in Canada. He can make some good money and get to do what he loves to do. Well, I'm glad you asked, Mike, uh, because you come to us for your Canadian football analysis. I've done some for you. So, again, CFL did not play last year. The two leading rushers for Toronto in 2019, James Wilder and Chris Rainey Jr., are both no longer on the roster. That might bode well, correct? Well, Toronto signed a guy named John White the Fourth. Uh, he came from the BC Lions. I know, Mike, your favorite uh, CFL team. Uh, where in uh, 2019, the last year they played, he was a 1,000-yard rusher. So odds would seem to be pretty good that this John White IV guy, John White the Fourth, is probably in, in line to be the lead back for the uh, for the Argos up there. They also have a guy named Bishop Sankey. If you're a college football fan, that name may sound familiar. He played for Washington. He's on the roster. Uh, if you have th- uh, two or three other running backs on the roster who have not made a ton of noise in the CFL slash NFL slash American Alliance of Football slash whatever the league is out there. So it seems like after this James White character, there are some opportunities. So maybe Greg will have a chance to crack the roster uh, and maybe make some significant playing time for the Argos. We'll see. Uh, but uh, definitely looks like, um, to your point, Mike, a, a good landing spot. I assume that, you know, uh, they reached out and, and he had an opportunity. Maybe he had other offers. We don't know. But hopefully he, he saw something he liked. And maybe he'll just, maybe just maybe he'll, he'll see some time on the field. Just to your point, a lot of a lot of UCF guys have gone up to Canada and had a great career. They've had, they've, they've had great times. We had Brandon Alexander. I think he won a, he won a championship up there. Tonight's guest, Justin Holman, spent some time up there. So it, it's definitely a, a place where you can go and play, make some good money, and continue playing uh, uh, your, you know, the sport you love, hopefully. Stand back. Stand back's another one that yep. uh, a running back from UCF is having a nice career up there too. So, um, yeah. Does it any word on how much he signed for? Or we don't know. That? No, I don't. That's not. I looked, but that doesn't doesn't really show. That's why I don't know if this is like a like an NFL thing where you get a free agent like signing to camp, or if this is an official on the roster thing. He's not showing on the official roster as of today, but not sure how quickly they update that stuff there in the Canadian Football League. It's usually the money tells you how interested they are in the guy. If they sign him to a big contract then he's pretty much guaranteed a starting spot. If it's just what well, the league minimum, then it may be kind of a tryout thing. Yeah. Uh, well, speaking of guys, Mike, I actually do have breaking news and that I have no news. Uh, so I reached out to a contact that uh, we have for Marlon Williams to see if there's any update on his status. Uh, and I have not yet heard back on uh, what's new with Marlon. But if we get any word back on that, I'll be happy to share that with everybody. Uh, obviously, we, we've kept good tabs on the rest of the guys. We know Jacob Harris is doing well out in, on the Rams. His name is getting thrown on a lot. Saw Trey Nixon wearing number 59 for some reason, Mike, in some photos on, on social media at Patriots camp. Uh, you know, Richie Grant, I think we saw, signed his contract. Aaron Robinson signed his contract. And so you're seeing some of those guys uh, get a chance. Otis uh, wasn't, uh, I think he's still maybe on on potential for the for the Tennessee Titans. I thought I saw his mom post on Twitter that uh, they didn't have room for him right now. So we'll see what, what works out there. But uh, still no update on Marlon. So if I get that back from his uh, his representatives, I'll be uh, be sure to pass it along either here or on our live show on Thursdays. Trey Nixon, number 59. They changed the rules, I know, in the NFL. Is it that you can wear any number at any position? No, I think it's a Belichick thing because I saw Mac Jones, the quarterback, was our number 50. So I think Belichick's just trying to be a jackass and giving these guys whatever the heck number he wants. 
<laughs> a little rookie hazing Patriots Probably, style, yeah. I guess. Doesn't matter what number you wear. It always matters. You know, actually, that's not Belichick. Yeah, the Delta football, do your job. You're going to get a number, but you need a number to wear. But, like, that's probably what, what that was. <laughs> I don't think it was anything more than that. But, um, all right, let's let's stay on coaches for a second, Mike. This one caught my eye this week. Uh, in an interview, uh, I guess he was at a camp. Uh, I was talking to some some kids, some counselors, some media people. I don't really know the whole the whole setting there. But our old friend Scott Frost got in front of the microphone, said a couple of things. He he made a couple of comments about one of the McCaffrey brothers that got a lot of uh, attention on social media because the other McCaffrey brothers, including Christian of the NFL's uh, Carolina Panthers, kind of got after him. But then he made these comments, Mike, when uh, someone asked him if he was having fun. Uh, he said, yes, he was having fun, but these three years have made me old. We took over a program as a coaching staff five years ago at another place that was broken, and we got it fixed really quick. Things kind of fell together. This place was probably more in need of uh, help than the last place I was at. So, Mike, that's where that's where Scott Frost is at. He's saying he feels old. These last three years have been tough, and it's more of a uh, of a rebuild at Nebraska than it ever was at UCF, Mike. So, Scotty's not looking too good. Scotty's not feeling too good, Mike. So, here's your charge on, charge off. Is it okay to feel bad for Scott Frost? Um. I'll charge off on that. I don't feel bad for him. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> I don't like that he's using the this place over there at that place now. That this place <laughs> is our thing. I think we've trademarked that now. We've made a video about it. So we are this place. Uh, but he's the one that started that whole this place stuff. So I guess he has some say in it. Um, you know, I don't feel bad for him because he left for the money and he's getting what you get. When you take that kind of money, you get the pressure that comes along with it and he hasn't been able to rebuild Nebraska like he thought it was, like he thought he'd be able to. It's obviously a lot harder than he thought it was going to be. And, you know, screw him, I guess. I mean, I, I don't – I'm not the one of the guys that hate Scott Frost like a lot of people do. So if he was doing well over there, then I wouldn't be throwing a party or anything, but it wouldn't bother me as much as it would bother some other people. But as he's not doing well, you know, I, I don't take pleasure in seeing him not do well, but I, I really don't care either way. Yeah, for me, you can charge right the hell off with this one uh, because, uh, again, I feel no sympathy for Scott. He had an opportunity to decide between two things, um, money and potentially being a legend. Now, would have would he have continued things at UCF the way they were? I think you said this a few different times when we did shows back those days right after he left, well, which was around he could have been our Bobby Bowden, right? He could have been that the guy with the statue outside of the uh, – well, another statue, I guess, outside of the stadium. Uh, he could have been our our kind of legendary coach uh, if he wanted to stay and really built this thing up and, and taken it from from you know a, a great a good program to a great program and chose not to and he chose the money as opposed to the legendary status. And I know there's no guarantees in life. The only guarantees are that he was guaranteed thirty five million dollars and any one of us would take that guarantee. So I don't blame him for doing it, but I don't feel sorry for him either because he had he had options. He had options, Mike. He could have been you know, legendary status. And we could have had a, a statue outside with a tight fitting polo. Um, and, uh, and, and that could have been his legacy at UCF. He took the money. It's not what he thought it was. Uh, it was an odd fit to begin with. I think Nebraska in the big 10 is an odd fit has been for a long time. I saw a graphic that our good buddy, uh, big game boomer put out around, uh, programs that have had the most like lopsided winning percentages. And Nebraska's on there three times over schools that are still in the big 12, not in the big 10. So they've definitely been miscast in the, in the big 10, um, so I don't feel bad for Scott uh, because he, he he made his choice. He had two options. He probably took the smarter one, right? Thirty five million is pretty good. Um, but I don't I don't feel bad for him, um, and I don't I don't feel sorrow that he's lamenting that now he's got a hard job because he probably should have thought about that before he signed up for the thirty five mil. All right, and just because he went undefeated here his last season, I mean, we all think he would have gone undefeated or had a great record every year after that. Not necessarily the case. Maybe he just is not as great of a coach as it seems he was in that one year. I remember the year before, he was a 500 team, and we lost in the, the Cure Bowl to Arkansas State. We got blown up. So, I mean, one good year, he cashed in on it. Good for him. But no guarantee that he would have been here for another 20 years. Maybe that his whole act would have worn thin after a couple of years here, too. So if he would have gone backwards and had the same season Heupel had last year, who knows what the case right now. He had the players in place. I mean, he did bring over Mackenzie Milton himself, so you got to give him credit for that. But you know, guys like Shaquem Griffin and, and that whole defense that was here in, before he got here, that George O'Leary defense was already there for him. So he he just kind of brought in some extra pieces with him. You know, Adrian Killens, things like that, which you got to give him credit for. But he hasn't been able to do that in Nebraska. So who knows what he would have been doing here these last couple of years. 
who knows? And I guess I guess we well we'll never have to know, right? We're into to new into different, and uh, we'll see how that works out, Mike. So those are your headlines. Those are charge on, charge off style, Mike. Before we go to uh, our first break here, I did want to quickly also offer some recognition for um, for Jan and Britt, uh, Lori, Probs, Trace. Uh, I don't know if everyone saw on social media, they put together a really cool event this Saturday for Lynn Cheek, a longtime UCF fan, uh, former member of the Marching Knights, who's got a tough battle going on right now and uh, a huge UCF fan. And uh, and they got a bunch of people to get out there. I saw Dylan Gabriel. I saw Sam Jackson. I saw Otis Anderson was there. Uh, a bunch of uh, UCF Twitter followers were there to, to honor Lynn and spend some time with her as well. So uh, obviously Mike and I not being in the area, unfortunately we couldn't make it. Uh, and, and we're real bummed about it because it looked like a really cool event. So just kudos to everybody who, who came out. Um, you know, it looked like a really great time and looked like uh, I know Lynn posted on, on social media the next day how happy she was, how excited she was. So just a big kudos to, to everybody involved in that because it looked like a really cool event for uh, a really special, uh, you know, uh, night for life type person in, uh, in Lynn. Yeah, I usually think that the internet is the root of all evil. Social media, nothing good comes out of it, but I was proven wrong in this case. Something good did come out of this. A very nice thing they did for her. And it just shows what we've been saying about UCF fans for the last few years now. How We are a family. And, you know, Ohana means family. And these people have showed that. You know, they, they really care. They put together this thing for somebody that really a lot of them didn't know personally. But people showed up because she's a knight and because they've seen her on social media and, they, and they've and they been following her now for a while with what she's been going through. So just to be there for a day to support her was a great thing to see. I'm glad they did something like that. Like like you said, I wish I could have been able to make it too. But, you know, we send Lynn our best thoughts and, and hope she does well. Maybe we'll have to send Lynn a hat one of these days too, Mike. I saw she didn't have a Sons of UCF hat on. That seems like a miss on our part. But, uh, but again, everybody involved in setting that up, good on you. And, uh, and Lynn, you keep charging on. Sons of UCF, we will be right back right after this. Okay, Sons of UCF, both of you, you are the all right, so the big three uh, has come back around this time. A, a Father's Day special edition. Like we are the sons of UCF, obviously, so we you know we have to roll something out for uh, for Father's Day. And here's what we decided to do: we have two different big three lists that's this week. That's right, not just one, but you get two for the price of one here. So here are the lists. Mike has compiled the big three list of father son duos who have both played or coached at UCF. And I have compiled the big three list of father-son duos of at least one of which has played at UCF. So you'll see the connection here in a second uh, as we get to it. So uh, Mike has UCF father-son. I have uh, at least one UCF father-son duo. So that's the big three list this week. We have no draft order or anything like that. We're picking from different lists. So you get two for the price of one, Mike. Those are the rules. You're going to lead off first with the uh, the... Uh, fathers and sons who have either played or coached at UCF. And uh, I'll let you kick it off, Mike. What is the third uh, uh, combination on your big three list? Well, I was just asking you right before we came out from break if I'm missing one because you know who I'm going with my three are. And maybe I am. I feel like that's I the, am. That's the risk of these lists is I feel like I'm missing one too and someone's going to be like, idiots, you forgot blank. And we're going to look foolish, which is not hard for us to do, by the way. Um, I don't know that you're missing one either, but I mean, I'm sure there's probably some – obscure like golf tandem that I don't, I don't know about. So, <laughs> All right. Well, I'm going number three on the list there. Well, one of them is still there right now. The head coach of the basketball team, Johnny Dawkins and his son, Aubrey Dawkins. When I compare it to the other duos on this list, they're a clear third to me. Aubrey only played really one season at UCF where he transferred over in 2016, 17 season, had to sit out that year. Then the next year in 17, 18, he was set out the whole year because of an injury. Then he finally gets him on the court in 18 and 19, puts up 15.6 points per game, shoots 82% from the free throw line, 41% from three, and of course has the best game of his UCF career on the final game against Duke, scoring 32 points. He has three steals. He's 12 for 18 from the field, five for seven from three. If that tip in goes in, that then they may move up on this list. Who knows how far because they go into the Sweet 16 and who knows from there, having taken out the number one team in Duke um, just by inches. 
and still haunts all UCF fans. We were that close to pulling off one of the most memorable games in tournament history if we win that one. So, but, you know, Aubrey was a very good player for us. And Johnny has, has been a good coach. He hasn't been great. You know, I like to get on him sometimes. He hasn't been bad. But he's been good. He he came in his first year, went 24-12, and 12, took us to the NIT Final Four. Um, from there, the record's kind of gone backwards a little bit, 19-13. and 13. Then he, he did have the 24-9 and nine year where we went to the tournament, won our first tournament game, beating VCU 73-58. That was our first time we got to, into the tournament as an at-large. So that's a big deal for us, too. Usually we had to win the tournament to get in. Gets us in that way. We win the game. Lose the heartbreaker to Duke. And then the last two years, though, backwards a little bit, like I said, 16 and 14, and then 11 and 12, his first losing season this past year. Only 8 and 10 in the conference this year, 7 and 11 the year before that. So nothing outrageous in conference. He did have us ranked in 2018-19 season. That was the first time since 2010. So you see the potential there with Johnny. You see where when he first came in, he was a defensive-minded coach. Looked like we're going to have shut down defense his whole time here. These last couple seasons, to me, have been a little disappointing. But overall, he's done a good job. That's a that's a cheer sound effect. I'm not sure if I like that one for uh, for number three. Uh, look, you know, Johnny perhaps has been one of the more snake bitten coaches I've ever seen, Mike. Because uh, between Aubrey's injuries, Taco Falls injuries, uh, we lose uh, Tony Johnson halfway in the season this year round. It seems like we've never been able. To, uh, to, to get it all together under Johnny's tenure. Some of it not his fault, a lot of it not his fault. Uh, it just isn't, uh, wasn't in the cards. We keep saying that he's going to have to have that big year. He keeps getting the talent. We know that. Uh, so can he do that again this year? Uh, hopefully. And Aubrey's another one of those cases, Mike. What if he had been healthy for his entire UCF career? Uh, you know, what, what could we have been? What if that, that stupid transfer rule wasn't in effect because he had to set a season leaving Michigan and come to UCF. What if we had had three years of Aubrey, uh, a healthy and a functional and productive Aubrey? Uh, what could have been at that point? So I think this is a really good number three because a lot of it's what could have been. Um, and, and for Johnny Dawkins, there is still a little bit of what can be. Uh, and to your point, we'll see what he can what he can muster up here in the 21-22 season. That's right. The book is not done on Johnny. So he can still write some more history here. Gets us back into the tournament, wins another game maybe gets us to the Sweet 16 for the first time ever, that he can still move the Dawkins duo up the list here. But it's going to be tough because the top two duos on this list are, are good ones. All right. So number number two, Bill and Billy Giovanetti. Um, Bill Giovanetti is a UCF Hall of Famer. He was inducted with Sean Beckton in the first ever, the first two football players ever inducted to the Hall of Fame. He was a starting linebacker for the first ever team in 1979. Started all 37 games he played. Set the record for tackles. And yeah, you want to tell me, well, anybody that played that first year set the record, right? <laughs> but his record lasted 10 years. So, And he's second all time right now, 429 career tackles. He also had a game where he had 23 tackles in one game. Jesus. He was all America honors in 1981. Went on to play for the Tampa Bay Bandits in the USFL. Uh, very good UCF career. If you walk around the stadium, you see the banners of the Hall of Famers. He's up there. And then his son, Billy, was a walk-on. And just like guys, like we talked about last week, Ronnie Weaver, walk-on stories are always good stories. Obviously, probably wanted to come here his whole life having his dad play here. Played a position that doesn't get a lot of glory in fullback. And I don't think we've even used the fullback now for the last four years. But that was his job, and he played in all 14 games in 2010, the championship season where we w win the conference, we go to the Liberty Bowl, we beat Georgia. He's the guy blocking for Ronnie Weaver and Latavius Murphy. Not getting any of the credit, but we don't get the job done without guys like Billy Giovanetti. He did score three touchdowns in his career, one of them against Ohio State, and pr participated a lot on special teams. So very good player. This duo, you, you got one Hall of Famer and one championship player that they're good enough for number two on the list. Solid list. Obviously you can't argue with the Giovanetti's, uh, 
UCF uh, bloodlines through and through. And you're right. You always love that underdog story uh, of a guy. Um, you know, Ronnie Weaver was one. Uh, Joe Papula was another that we talked to, talked with recently. You always love those kind of stories. Uh, it's always cool to see uh, somebody follow in their dad's footsteps too, right? A, a legacy issue uh, is, is always, uh, always a cool thing. Um, we don't have a ton of them at UCF. Uh, so it's cool to, to see stuff like that too. So a very good inclusion uh, on number two. And if you're out there listening and you don't know what number one is, um, hit stop now. I guess start start listening to something else. I don't, I don't know what to tell you because if you don't know number one, Mike, it's pretty telegraphed. But uh, the number one father son duo is. Well, I bet you there are some people that don't know. Who uh, any of these are you guys kidding? Are. Really? <laughs> hey, some of these kids that are. I mean, if you're listening to this show and you just started going to UCF these last couple of years, you may have no idea who Torchy Clark, Bo Clark, and Mike, Mike Clark. Let's not forget three hall of famers from the Clark family. Torchy started the basketball program at UCF in 1969, had a record of 274 and 89. That's a 75, 754 win percentage. Pretty good. And he had those numbers memorized because when we were in his class, he would write them on the board every time. That and his total win numbers, which I can't remember what it is right now, but it's something ridiculous. He had like an 80% winning percentage as a head coach. Uh, he had the team ranked in the top 10 for Division II seven years in a row, six tournament appearances, five times led the team to win the Sunshine State Conference. In 1978, took the team all the way to the Final Four. He is a member of four different Hall of Fames, Remember when we had George O'Leary on and you said, well, I'm in a bunch of Hall of Fames? <laughs> so is Torchy Clark. <laughs> Torchy Clark's in a bunch of Hall of Fames and was a great teacher. Came back after he was done to teach at UCF. We were lucky to have a class. You had a couple classes with him. I had one. The most entertaining class I had at UCF. I loved going to Torchy's class. It was so much fun. Uh, just a, a guy. He was, what, in his 70s at the time? And just a ball of energy, man. You it was it was contagious being around that guy. I could only imagine what he was like when he was in his prime coaching these guys. Then you got his sons, Bo and Mike. Bo has every record you can think of at UCF, points in a game. He scored 70 points in one game. He scored 806 points in a season. And for his career, 2,886 points. And guess what? There was no three-point line when Bo played. So... <laughs> He was doing that without a three-point line. It's, it's an incredible to even think about. He led the nation in scoring with 31.6 points in 1978 and 79 season. Led the team to the playoffs three times. The one year they, he didn't lead on the playoffs is because he was hurt. And that actually turned out to be the year the team went to the Final Four, believe it or not. So that goes back to Torchy. Give Torchy some credit for that one. His number 23 is retired. He went on to be a coach himself over at St. Augustine for a long time. We had him on the show. I forget what episode it was. It was early on, probably episode 20-something. 20 28, 29, uh, yeah, someone there. Great guy, Bo Clark. And like I said, don't forget Mike Clark, who is the older brother. He was the, He's also a Hall of Famer, and he played for UCF the first four years. The program was around from 69 to 73. He had a chance to play in Division One. turned it down, wanted to play with his dad. The team went 67 and 25 in his time here. He was the leading scorer. Uh, UCF all time for a while until his brother came and broke his record. He scored over 2000 points, 2085 career points for Mike Clark. Uh, the three of them, uh, when you, when you talk about three hall of famers, there is no way you could beat that. Any other family in UCF, the, the Clarks are UCF royalty. The first family of UCF sports, I would assume. Right. Uh, and Bo Clark wrote a book about his dad called Torchy, which is available. I think pretty much anywhere you want to get, your books these days uh and if you want to learn more about torchy and, and sort of what he built at ucf and what his sons um, and his whole family kind of meant to orlando in the community it's definitely a definitely a good read so i would check it out but yeah there's no other number one answer like that that is the that's the answer that's the list there there's no close second uh the clarks are ucf athletics royalty there's no way around it that's right and there's some other really good families where we had to do uh father sons here when you talk about brothers, you talk about the Hinshaw brothers that came around. You've got a bunch of twins, obviously, with the Griffin twins and the McCrays and things like that. But we're doing father-sons. Nobody comes close to the Clarks. 
Speaking of which, why don't we have like why isn't the court or something named after Torchy? Like what 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 do we gotta do to start that? Like at least the locker rooms at the UCF. I mean, I know we're starting to Schneider on, on the live show is willing to take a urinal. Uh, I know uh, you know uh, Bortles and Murray are gonna have the training room. Maybe it's a donation thing, but we can't get like Torchy Clark, you know, court or you know the the Torchy Clark locker room. We can't get anything like that. I want to say it was named after him for I think only a year. Maybe it was the last year before the arena was built. Yeah. I, I'm pretty sure we had his name on the court. It was Toshi Clark Court at UCF Arena or whatever. And then I think is when we built the new arena. They just never transferred it over, which is a shame. It should be at all times Torchy Clark Court. Or, you know, maybe you don't have to name the whole arena after him, but name the court after him. Yeah. Uh, the guy was doing it when they were we were playing in the education building. <laughs> He started the program. He is the father of UCF basketball, and the UCF basketball record is way better than the UCF football record. We're way over 500 in basketball all time. So uh, it was our most successful sport for a long time. We need to get Carlos McCants back on the show and see how we make that happen. All right, so that's Mike's big three list of father-son duos, both of whom went to UCF. My task was uh, father-sons, but not uh, were not both of them actually went to UCF. So I had two different ways I could have done this, Mike. I could have done famous UCF fathers and then their sons, or I could have done uh, UCF sons and their famous fathers. I chose the latter on this one because with all due respect to Asante Samuel and Asante Samuel Jr., most of us, you know, didn't get to, uh, we didn't get to root for Asante Samuel Jr. because he played for the Seminoles. Same thing with Sean Jefferson. His his son, Van Jefferson, played for the play, uh, played for the Gators. feels really weird to root for those guys. They didn't really come to UCF of recent years. So I did the inverse, Mike. I did um, sons who came to UCF and their famous fathers, which probably is going to give you a dead giveaway who, who number one is. But uh, stick around. You never know what will happen to you in this list, Mike. The three spot was harder than I thought it was because while there were a couple of options available to me, I was trying to find at least somebody who's had a, you know some impact on UCF and, and played well. Uh, and so th- this one was a tough one for me, Mike. By number three is Trillion Coles and his, uh, his father, former uh, FSU receiver and NFL receiver, Lavernius Coles. So Trillion Coles, Lavernius Coles, Trillion did not play last year with a with a, a knee injury. The year prior to that, he got in seven games. He had 168 yards, uh, averaged 5.1 yards a carry. He was an exciting guy, Mike. He was one of those guys whose name kept coming out during spring game, uh, recovering from a knee injury, a local kid in Orlando. Uh, obviously a crowded backfield, but he's always had potential. He's a, he's a smaller back, so we'll see where he where he fits on the, on the depth chart, Mike. And obviously his dad, Lavernius Coles, uh, played a number of years in the NFL, finished with 8,600 uh, yards receiving, uh, 49 touchdowns, uh, made one Pro Bowl, had three 1,000-yard receiving seasons, uh, pretty solid receiver for the Jets and the now Washington football team. Uh, so uh, number three, Trillion Coles, Lavernius Coles, Mike. Trillion is a name we've heard now for a long time. For the last few years, it seems like we've just been waiting for him to bust out. Yeah, he had the huge spring game a couple of years ago, and then injuries have kind of gotten in his way. I think uh, actually somebody, maybe it was one of the replay interviews we just did, was talking about how he, he's one of the most talented guys there are on the team musically. The guy mm-hmm. makes his own music. He he can sing. He can dance. He can do it all. So you, even after his football career is over, you may hear from this guy becoming a superstar, you know, just you know, a pop star. Who knows? Wow. But uh, and, and his dad, his dad was very good. His dad was a very good player. Yeah, he played for Florida State. That's a that's a knock against him, but you know, very very good player for the Jets for a long time in Washington. Um, he was fun to watch. A small guy, but not scared to stick in, stay in there and take a big hit. He can return punts. He can do a lot of things. So I like watching Lavernius play. Trillion and Lavernius Coles, my number three. Again, this is probably the one that's the most debatable. So if I got anything wrong, it's probably at this number three spot here, Mike. Because I don't think you can argue with my top two. Number two is former uh, UCF and uh, outfielder slash uh, fullback running back and Hall of Famer D. Brown and his father, uh, NFL player, former University of Miami star Jerome Brown. So if you don't know about D. Brown, D. Brown, a two-sport star, uh, his, he made his name really in baseball. That's where he ended up getting drafted, and that's where he ended up sort of pursuing his career, uh, where he finished his UCF career, 298 hits, 229 RBIs, 26 home runs. On the football side of things, he finished with four rushing touchdowns, two receiving touchdowns. Uh, he played uh, a better part of a couple of seasons on, on both. Towards the end, decided that baseball is his path and decided to, to go that route. Ended up getting drafted, spending some time in, the, in some minor league camps. 
uh, and and, uh, and and then his career went from there. But he was inducted in the UCF Hall of Fame. And his dad, Jerome Brown, uh, played uh, five years, six years with the Philadelphia Eagles, uh, 29 and a half sacks. Uh, he had 10 fumble recoveries. He was a big part of those Miami defenses back in the day with Warren Sapp and Russell Maryland and, and all those guys. Uh, he was uh, he was an integral part. Um, tragically lost his life in an automobile accident, um, but uh, would have had a hell of an NFL career uh, with somebody that a lot of guys respected in the league and, and still talk about today. Uh, so unfortunately, his, his career cut short. But D. Brown, a UCF Hall of Famer, a two sports star, which is not easy to do, uh, and obviously Jerome Brown, who was a, a fantastic football player in his own right. Mike. So number two are the Browns, D. and Jerome. D. Brown, you can hear out here on Sons of UCF episode number seventy seven. Obviously, you can't hear it, but it did happen. It, it's Believe true. Us, it's true. I was there. <laughs> Maybe one day we'll replay that one. He was a good one. Two sports star. I mean, the guy could, was just a masher at the plate in baseball. He was dropping bombs all the time. And a, a very good football player, too. So he he's one of the best all-around athletes I think we've seen come through UCF. And his dad, like you mentioned, was a bad man. <laughs> <laughs> he, he was somebody I hated going up against. Obviously, he played all those years for the Eagles, uh, just destroying Phil Sims so many times that you know I, I hated watching him play just because he was going against me all the time. But a very good football player in Jerome Brown, and uh, that, that's a pretty good combination. Some good genetics there in that family. Yeah, that deep run interview was nice too because it was a really good trip down memory lane and uh, his career in baseball and football. So we, we should bring that back to everybody at some point because uh, that was a good one. Uh, and that's my number two, Mike. And number one's probably pretty obvious. Uh, and look, this one was probably more for the uh, the father side of things than the uh, the son side of things. But it's uh, none other than Mr. Michael Jordan and his son, uh, Marcus Jordan. His son, Jeffrey, also put at UCF for a while, but I'm going to give it to Marcus because he actually stayed three years. Jeff is only here for one. Uh, but Michael and Marcus Jordan, I don't know that I need to run down the Michael Jordan stats for you, but if I do, uh, he averaged 30 points a game in his, in his NBA career, six titles. He's a Hall of Famer. Uh, one of the uh, probably widely res- uh, regarded as the best all-time basketball player. Um, you know, somebody who won Olympic gold medals, a, a fantastic documentary about him, uh, kind of chronicles his competitiveness, took some time off to play baseball, came back and played for the Wizards, was still dropping like 55 as a 40 year old guy, uh, is worth a billion dollars in the shoe deals, uh, owns the Charlotte Hornets. Uh, certainly uh, Michael Jordan's done pretty good for himself. And his son, Marcus, Mike, came to UCF out of uh, out of high school in Chicago. Um, was a was a decent player, but listen, when your dad's Michael Jordan, living up to those expectations are probably harder than anyone can imagine. Uh, in his three years here, Marcus averaged twelve point three a game. Uh, that's highlighted by he had fifteen in that twenty ten twenty eleven season. Mike uh, again, a solid player, probably best known at UCF. Mike for two things: one, he wore goggles or some sort of a. Uh, uh, a spectacle situation, and two, he's the guy who wore his uh, his father's shoes on the court when we had an Adidas contract, and that ended up getting our Adidas contract canceled out, and there's some lawsuits threatening and all this other stuff. Uh, we, I think we had Keith Tribble on to talk about all that at some point, too, another interview that you can't hear anymore, but trust us, it happened. Uh, and ultimately, that's what got us into a, a, a Nike school. Uh, I think Marcus is still somewhat around uh, UCF and Orlando at times. Um, even Michael came to a few games at UCF Arena when Marcus and, and Jeff were playing, uh, which is pretty cool to have Michael in the, in the house there. Uh, so probably more for his dad than himself, but it's Michael and Marcus Jordan, number one father-son combo. Marcus led us to some bi- pretty big wins in his time. I mean, we beat UConn in the Bahamas in the, one of the early season opening classics. We, we played them. And then, of course, beating the Gators in the first game ever played at the Amway Center. That was a big win for us at the time. Uh, so he was fun to watch. You know, the teams never quite did. I mean, they got to that hot start in 2010 and it just fell apart. I don't know how. But very good teams. And, I mean, Michael Jordan, what, what, what can you say? He's probably the best to ever do it. But just when you mentioned his stats, he scored 30 points per game, right? I know it's the NBA. Just bringing me back to my Bo Clark, Clark stat, 31 <laughs> points per game for Bo in obviously less time because college games a lot shorter and no three-point line. So <laughs> that just made that even more amazing to me. Bo outscored Michael Jordan. I know it's not the same, but <laughs> still. <laughs> but, yeah, Michael Jordan – a name that goes beyond basketball. I mean, with with the Gatorade and the Nike and all that stuff. Be like Mike commercials when we were kids. Everybody wanted to be Mike, like Michael Jordan, except for me. I hated him because he played on the Bulls and they always beat the Knicks at the time. So 
uh, I didn't even have my first pair of Jordans until I, I was in my 30s. I, it was a nice pair of sneakers that I wanted. I think I've only had one ever in my life. Hmm. Yeah, I mean, again, probably a no-brainer and, and maybe a bit of a, of a cheat on that one, Mike. So my list, again, is Trillian, Lavernius, Coles, Jerome, D. Brown, and then Michael and Marcus Jordan. Here's the honorable mentions, Mike. Rashawn Lewis and Ray Lewis. Rashawn Lewis, I, I couldn't find any um, any stats for Rashawn, so I don't know if he ever got on the field in any re- uh, uh, meaningful minutes. I think he's now in his third school. I think he went to FAU, and now he's at Kentucky, if I have that right. I mentioned Asante Samuel Jr. Uh, and Asante Samuel, Van Jefferson and Sean Jefferson. And then, Mike, what about Otis Anderson and Otis Anderson? Well, that's not ah, that. just kidding. I know. Everyone likes to think they're related. <laughs> that would have been a good one, too, if that actually was legit. That probably would have made the list if we'd have had Otis yeah. and Otis. But uh, there, no relation there. Of course, everyone thinks they are, but they're really not related. So those are my honorable mentions. I'm sure I missed one, Mike. I'm sure you missed one. Uh, so uh, if we did, find us on social media. Uh, tell us we're idiots. It happens all the time. Uh, and uh, if you disagree with our list in any way, shape, or form, we'd love to hear from you as well. Uh, again, at Sons of UCF or at UCF Mike One on social media. But coming up next, Mike, Justin Holman uh, and a replay from an interview we did about a couple of years ago still holds true today. And if you're thinking to yourself, what is Justin Holman? Like, I don't even remember his career. A couple of things you should think about. One, he almost single handedly saved us in Ireland. Two, the hell Perryman, need I say more? And then three, he brought us the white horse. All that's covered in great detail, and you can hear it next, only in the Sons of UCF. I wouldn't move if I were you. No, I really, I, I'm seriously, I wouldn't move. Don't move. Did you move? I told you not to. This is UCF head football coach Gus Malzahn, and you're listening to the Future of UCF podcasting with Adam and Mike on the Sons of UCF. Boom. All right, we're really excited to have our next guest join us today. This guy played a really interesting role um, in the history of UCF, and uh, once you find out who it is, you'll know why. Uh, He starred uh, on the field for us from uh, 2013-2016. He was a a quarterback for us and, and played on some pretty memorable teams. It is the one and only Justin Holman. Justin, thanks for joining us on the show tonight. Hey, no problem. I appreciate y'all for having me, man. I look forward to this thing, and uh, I'm excited to be here. Awesome. Well, let's uh, let's start at the very beginning. Let's go back. Uh, so you uh, you're at Stevenson High School in Georgia. Um, yes, sir. When did UCF start recruiting you, and what did you know about the school when you first uh, found out or, or talked to UCF? So yeah. Um, UCF first started recruiting me my junior season going into my senior season. So right around the end of my junior season, that's when I started to call from UCF. And uh, Coach Danny Barrett was a, was my recruiting coach. He came and uh, saw me at practice one day. And after practice, he was like, oh, yeah, we need to offer this kid. And I probably talked to him like once or twice after that before I ended up committing. But I didn't really know much about UCF at all. Didn't do a lot of prior research, but – yeah, man, that was pretty much my recruiting experience with UCF. So, what made you pick UCF? Obviously, if you hadn't uh, didn't get a, a ton of research, uh, what uh, what sold you on coming all the way down to Orlando? Honestly, I didn't even visit UCF before I committed. I probably talked to Coach Barrett uh, like two or three times on the phone. Never talked to Coach O'Leary, but um, honestly, I was about to commit to NC State or Wake Forest, and then right before I did, I, I just got down on my knees and I prayed. And as soon as I got done praying, I felt convicted in my heart to go to UCF, and that's why I took it. Wow, that's pretty, that's pretty strong right there. I don't know how, yeah. you, <laughs> how you can say no to that. Oh, um, man, it was just a leap of faith, just a leap of faith. Am I remembering this right? Did Were you supposed to redshirt your freshman year? Uh, Precisely, yeah. I was. <laughs> me, me and Pete DeNovo were supposed to redshirt our freshman year. And then uh, Gabbert, he ended up uh, leaving the team. And then uh, that forced me into the – well, catapulted me into the backup position behind Blake Borders. Right. And I remember you came in for a couple of snaps at the end of the uh, FIU game, right? That was your first game? <laughs> yeah, that was my first game. And I knew – we found out the day before that I would be the backup. So <laughs> I didn't, <laughs> didn't have much intro with the game plan because I was on scout team. But it, it was fun at the same time, though. So were you ready? Because, like, mentally you had to go into the whole season thinking, I'm going to be redshirting, you know, I'm not going to play. And then, boom, all of a sudden you're in the game and your redshirt's gone. Are you mentally ready for that? 
Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, one thing Coach O'Leary made sure is that no matter what your role is on the team, red shirt or not, you was prepared for anything. So I was prepared going into it. Well, that season obviously ended uh, – in a, in a Fiesta Bowl win against Baylor, obviously our, our first New Year's Six Bowl uh, game and win. Uh, so how exciting was it for you to be a part of that as a true freshman? Man, it, it kind of set the standard for the rest of my career at UCF. Um, just being behind a winning quarterback, learning what championship football looks like, what it takes to lead a team to a championship, that was definitely something big to have in your first year and it just kind of set the standard for the for the rest of the young guys and then later on for my career at UCF. So then going into 2014 and Blake decides to go into the draft. When did yep. you find out he was leaving? Uh actually me and Blake were watching film on the Fiesta Bowl uh shortly after that and we were just sitting down talking about the game and then he just he put the clicker down and he looked me dead in the eye and he said hey, man, uh, you ready to take this thing over because I'm declaring for the draft? And I was like, yeah, man, handle your business, and uh, I'm going to make sure I do right by you once you leave it in my hands. And uh, that was how she wrote after that. Oh, that's pretty cool. Yeah. So then it was up to you and DeNovo, right, going in. Did you think you had this, the job in hand going into that uh, camp, coming out of that camp, going into uh, Ireland? Going into Ireland, um, you know, Pete DeNovo was declared the starter. He he won a job. Uh, it was a fair competition. Uh, he won it during camp. And uh, he was, I mean, he was great competition, man. He brought out the best of me, brought out the best of him. He edged me out. And, uh, yeah, he was the starter going into it. So I was prepared for whatever, though, in Ireland. Uh, I knew if I got a shot that I would execute to the best of my ability. Well, fortunately, what did the coaches tell you? Like, the, the, like – a week before the game or a couple days before the uh, game? Yeah, they, they announced that he would be a, the starter about um, a week before we left for Ireland. So we were in Ireland for roughly around like six days or so. So even a week before we left for Ireland, they let me know that he would be a starter. So he started getting more reps going into the game, and uh, I became the backup after that. All right. Well, fortunately, that decision didn't last uh, didn't last too long. So let's let's hop back in the way back machine for a second. So let's go back to that 2014 opener, right? You're in Ireland, like you said. You're facing Penn State. We're down 10-3. There's 6:50 to go in the third quarter, and uh, and somebody comes up to you and tells you go you're going into the game. Who uh, who came up to you and told you you were going in? Oh, Coach O'Leary. All right. He so- just uh, he pointed at me and he said, "Get ready." So I started warming up after that, and then uh, went into the game. Did right, he so, call you Ace? <laughs> no, he didn't call me Ace. <laughs> he just he pointed at me, saying, "Get ready with the uh, with that deadly stare that he has." And I knew what it was as soon as he looked at me. All right, so you get in the huddle, uh, and uh, what do you say to the team? Uh, I really didn't say much. I was just more focused on doing my job. But um, as the game progressed, you know what I'm saying, and uh, I got a feel for what Penn State was doing and, and how we were doing as a team. I was able to talk more, lead more. But uh, at first, I was just making sure that I was doing my job at first. So I didn't say much yeah. when I first got in there, but uh, as the game went on, that's when I began to talk a little bit more. Yeah, so what do you remember about that first drive? So we obviously had struggled moving the ball on offense, and then you get in the yeah. game, and you promptly lead them down the field in about four minutes, and you score on a QB keeper. What do you remember about that first drive, just how things were, were working for you, how things were clicking for you? What, what memories do you have of that? Uh, I just remember that. Penn State looked exactly like I thought they would. Like, it literally felt like I was playing that game in slow motion because all that summer, I was watching so much film on them that by the time I got to the game and they were actually in front of me, I mean, that's that's probably the slowest i ever seen a game of football move in my life. It looked like people were moving in slow motion. So I, I just couldn't believe how slow the game was when I was out there. So were you, when you were on the sidelines, uh, you know, before you got in, were you asking coaches, were you talking to – you know, Coach Baird or anybody in trying to uh, trying to get in the game? Uh, absolutely not. I believe that when a coach is making a decision, especially when you're not the starter, your job as a backup is to encourage the guys that are in there and especially the starting quarterback in front of you because um, that's a big thing. I, I'm kind of big on never undermine, undermining a guy, even though he's a, my co- competition. He's still my teammate. So I didn't want to, like, you know, be on the sideline, like, hey, coach, put me in. I feel like the coaches made the right decision when they felt like they needed to. 
And but up until then, I was just supporting Pete DeNovo as much as I could. Well, obviously, we so we almost pulled that thing out, right? So you score a TD with about a minute thirteen to go. Uh, did you yeah. think that was enough to win? Did you think we had sealed the the win after that score? Uh, I was just very confident in our defense. I'm, I'm pretty sure a lot of people can tell by my celebration that I thought <laughs> the game was over, but that was just me being a young quarterback. But um, I was I was just very confident in my defense that we can get that stop and then come back home with the win. Uh, unfortunately, it didn't happen that way, but uh, still proud of my guys from fighting back the way we did. Yeah, I thought for sure that was going to be the it. Uh, we were going to win that game when you scored. Yeah. But, uh, oh, man. After that game, then we lose to Missouri the next week. And, mm-hmm. you know, that was, we were in that game, a couple of mistakes here, like mid-third quarter, and it kind of got away. But then yeah. we went on to win eight of the next nine, right? So you guys righted the ship. What do you think was the yeah. biggest factor in that turnaround? Um, I mean, we always had – we had the talent. We had the pieces in place. We just had to, you know, continue to find our identity. And we found our identity, and we got on the roll. And uh, a, a big part of that was coaching. A big part of that was my teammates. I mean, we had a lot of great talent on that team at every single position. So, I mean, it, it was really a lot of guys around me and my team that helped us push to eight or nine wins and make it, you know, nine games. So nobody was panicking after that starting at 0-2? Oh, absolutely not. Absolutely not. Nobody was panicking in the locker room. Nobody was down on ourselves. We knew that the goal coming into the season was to win the conference championship and that those two games didn't affect our chance to do uh, to do so. So we just got back focused on our original goal and then went from there. All right, we're looking back on that season, Justin. You had, uh, in my estimation, you had three games that uh, were, were huge, three big games that year. We talked about one uh, at Penn State. So here's the next one I want to talk to you about. Um, let's talk a little bit about that game against BYU. Um, so it was, a, it was a 31-24 home win overtime. Uh, you had a rushing TD early and then came back to throw two late TDs, including a bomb on a, on a free play to Justin, uh, Josh Reese. Excuse me. What do you remember most from that, that, that throw to Josh Reese? Oh, uh, man, I just remember because our center, Joey Grant, was telling me the whole time, like, hey, man, if we can go false cadence on them at the right moment, man, we can get a big play. So uh, I just listened to Joey on that play. Uh, we took a shot, and I knew uh, Josh, who we call Dave. I know Josh has the, uh, probably had the surest hands on the team, man, so I just threw him up gave him a chance, and he made an excellent play. He made an excellent play, and uh, I know I was excited after that throw. So, yeah, man, that was that was a big throw and a big turn of events for us. And then you obviously you had the – he had the, the pass that also uh, ended up essentially winning the game for us too. How how exciting was that game overall? I know it was, it was kind of an up and down game. Uh, so how how exciting was that for you guys to to come back and uh, and put a W on the board that day? That was big because I feel like that was one of the one of the key games that earned my trust with Coach O'Leary. I know he put a lot of pressure on me during that week coming into the game to perform well, and he put a lot on my plate. And I feel like. I performed well. Of course, I made some mistakes in that game, but we were able to overcome them and uh, made some key plays in the end and get the win. Yeah, that BYU game was great. Great game. So I got to bring up this one. Yep. The UConn sure. game. Yep. The UConn game, man. What happened with this one? This was not a uh, – this isn't like a every once in a while a decent UConn team. This is, one, yeah. this is still one of the typical – two. they only won two games that year. Us sure and Stony enough. Brook. By three points, man. Mm-hmm. I, I don't know what we were favored in this game, but did we take them lightly? What do you think? What happened? No, nah, we, we definitely didn't take them lightly. I just – that game was totally on me. It wasn't coaching. It wasn't the guys around me. That game was completely on me. Uh, I had too many turnovers in that game. Uh, I believe in that game I threw four picks. And uh, that, those are costly mistakes, especially a pick I threw right before halftime that put them up a score that kind of, you know – Made, made us go outside of our game plan coming back in the second half. So that game was totally on me. But, no, we didn't take them lightly. It wasn't that we were ill-prepared. It was just uh, it was just a bad game by the quarterback. Hey, but the weather played a factor. Was it cold? Was it the cold? Was it the – could you get a grip on the ball? Was it something like no, that? No, it, like- it, it wasn't the cold. We played in cold games before. We didn't play it in rainy games before down in Orlando. It was just, you know, one of those days where the ball wasn't bouncing in my favor. We had a couple tip picks, uh, a couple picks directly to DBs on bad reads. So it was just a culmination of events, and they executed off of our turnovers, and we didn't win the turnover battle. And usually when you turn the ball over, 
more than the other team you lose. So Yeah, and we actually still had a chance at the end, right? Yeah, we had a chance. I believe we were down by eight points. Uh we were trying to drive on the last drive. Um and couldn't pull it out in the end. Is it true that O'Leary turned the heaters off or didn't allow, allow the heaters to be turned on on the sidelines that game? Uh, I don't know much about that. <laughs> <laughs> you know, trying, come on. I, I don't know. I don't know much about that. I was trying to make adjustments on the sideline with Coach Key and trying to figure out the best way to move forward about the game. I wasn't even focused on trying to get warm or anything like that. I was just trying to write my wrongs as best as possible. But you may have heard things like that too, right? Yeah, I may have heard a thing about that. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Justin. Well, as crazy as all those games were, it's not even close to being the craziest from uh, from that season. So let's go back to this one. Obviously, it's one of the most iconic plays in UCF history. We're at ECU. Uh, they always play us tough there. We struggled there historically, right? So let's start here. Um, Ten seconds to go. The ball's on our 35-yard line. We're down 30-26. to 26. Uh, The first play, you ended up completing a bullet to Josh Reese on the sideline. What were you looking for on that on that first play of that drive? That's it. That's exactly where the ball was intended to go. Honestly, I felt like that was the best throw of the whole drive. One of my better throws of probably my career, uh, because it was so precise. But I mean, um, yeah, that's that's exactly where that ball was intended to go. And he made a great catch on the sideline. So again, just going to the surest hands on the team to me in that case and letting them, you know, do what he does. Yeah, that's, to me, that's an underrated play because obviously, if we don't we don't hit that play. Uh, it doesn't set exactly. us up for uh, for what's next. So, all right. So let's 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 get through what's next here. So now it's on our forty nine yard line. We have five seconds left. You guys didn't huddle up. So how did you communicate to to the team what you were going to do? Was it a hand signal? Was it a play call? Or did you guys already just know? Did you call two plays in the huddle the play before that? Yeah. So uh, before we came on the field, we called two plays uh, on the sideline, and the guys knew what it was. I said, hey, as soon as we complete this ball, get back up on the line because we're going straight back. So I hear Mary play, and uh, I mean the rest is history. Well, let's yeah, let's get it into the play for a second. So um, rewatching it again, there there's uh, obviously you had you had three guys on the on the left. Um, it looked like uh, looked like Speedy Hall was kind of going a, a sideline route, um, and Perryman yeah. was was kind of running a, a post there. Was he the designated receiver from the start, or did you see something at the line of scrimmage that let you know that he was going to be your main target on that play? Honestly. Honestly, we were supposed to have a, a tip man and a guy to catch the ball, and Rashad Perriman was our tip man on that play. But um, I just figured if I threw it as high as I could and as long as, and as long as I could, really as high as I could, I felt like nobody could beat our receivers on a jump ball on a play like that. So I just threw it as high as I could. I honestly I wasn't aiming even to make it an end zone. I just felt like if I threw it as high as I could, that one of our receivers would come down with it and. Sure enough, Bashar Perriman made the play. How, so how soon after you threw it did you realize that somebody had a chance to catch that thing? Uh, not until he caught it. <laughs> <laughs> not until he caught it. I just let it go, and I watched it fall. And I, honestly, from the angle I was saying, I couldn't see if he caught it or not. So the first thing I saw was everybody rushing off our sideline. So I held, I held my hands to my helmet, and I looked around for a flag. I made sure there was no flags. And then after that, man, I... I went crazy. I probably caught the Holy Ghost out there thanking Jesus a hundred times and pointing at my mom because I know she was up there praying. <laughs> so, yeah, that's what that was. Well, so for me, the most memorable thing from that play, um, if you watch the replay, I don't think I've ever seen um, George O'Leary smile that much or that happy. Is that the happiest you've ever oh. seen Coach O'Leary? Yeah, I've never I've never seen him smile that much either. <laughs> <laughs> I've never <laughs> I never seen him smile that much either, but I'm glad that you know I can have that moment for him. I know how big conference championships are to him. Any type of win, I know how like important any type of win is to him. So it, it was good to see him happy, man, enjoying that. All right. So how how often do people still ask you about that play? How often uh, you know are people around UCF or you know wherever you're at? How often is that brought up to you? Uh, that's that's probably the most uh, memorable moment people bring up. Like if they meet me, and they be like, oh. uh, are you just in the quarterback? I'm like, yeah. They were like, man, I remember watching that ECU game, and I was I was asleep, and then I woke up and I saw it on Sports Center. It's, it's usually stories like that, man. So, yeah, everybody's uh, it's, a story it's, from that game, right? <laughs> yeah, everybody seen to have a story like, man, I ain't gonna lie, I thought you guys were gonna lose that game, <laughs> and next thing you know, you throw. So, I mean, you get a lot of stories like that, but it's always fun to hear them and hear how people experience it. 
All right, so ju- just us talking here, Justin, just me and you talking here. How uh, how upset do you get that people call that the, the Hale Perryman and your name is nowhere in that play? Oh, it don't matter to me because I still got that conference championship ring. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> as long as I got the ring, yeah, man, I, I'm not too big on getting attention and all that type of stuff. He He's the one that made a great catch in that play. I mean, he was behind three defenders that misjudged the ball, so – out of four people for him to judge it correct, I mean, he had to be doing something right. So, I mean, he made a, a great catch and a great play for us. Yeah, but we, we could call it the Hale Perry Holman, right? Like, we could figure out a way to make it all work. But, I mean, we'll work <laughs> we on that can, later. We can, figure, we can figure something out. <laughs> oh, yeah, I like that. We can switch it up now. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> all right, so heading into 2015 now. Yep. I don't want. Well, I don't know why I have to talk about all the bad stuff. Anyway, <laughs> oh, it's because, I mean, it, it was a lot that happened. It was a lot that happened. <laughs> but we lose the tough one to FIU. Okay, we were up in that game, fourteen three at the half. You hit Justin Aiken. I mean, I'm sorry, you hit Jordan Aikens for uh, two touchdowns in the first half, right? Yep. I, I, everything looks like it's fine, you know. Uh, what that, what happened in the second half? Did we go too conservative? We didn't turn the ball over in that game. Uh. I'm not sure, man. It's, it was just a, a culmination of events. We had some key third downs that we didn't convert. We had a, a fourth and one down in their territory that we didn't convert. Um, it was just a lot of key plays that we missed. And um, I'll put that on myself as well. I feel like it was some throws I could have made um, on some crucial third downs that could have kept us on the field, extending drives and chewing up the clock. But uh, I don't. I don't believe it was coaching at all. Uh, we just got to execute better as players on, on some of the plays, especially me. I think at the end of that game, though, O'Leary could have gotten co- a little closer for that field goal. He made it seem like what was it, like a forty-four yarder or something? It wasn't that easy? Yeah, it, it wasn't an easy kick. But we also had one of the better kickers in our conference, one of the better kickers in the nation. I mean, I mean, if that kick gets off. There's no question in my mind that, you know, we win that game, but unfortunately it gets blocked at the line. So, I mean, whether it was far or not, too close, I mean, if it doesn't get blocked, that may be a whole different story. But, I mean, we could have got closer, but it was what it was, and it is what it is. Justin, I love you, bro. <laughs> George blew that game. George blew that game. <laughs> <laughs> you, can, you can say it now. No, nah, I can't. I can't, I man. I can't. I can't. I can't say it. I, I'll say it. I'll say it. Yeah, you just did. All right, so, so so next week you guys travel cross country play at Stanford. Uh, you got hurt early yeah. in that game. Um, yeah. I guess how how bad were you hurt? How uh, did you know you were hurt right away? Um, take us back to that play and uh, and what you remember from that uh, from that injury. Yeah, man, it was third down and ten. I remember the play call. It was the first drive of the game. I believe we were roughly on around the thirty some yard line. Uh, dropped back for a pass and I got hit. And when I went to push myself off the ground. My right hand was hurting a little bit. So I looked down at it and sure enough, my bone on my right index finger was sticking out of my hand. So my, actually my bone, my bone on my throwing hand came, came out and my skin was kind of like flapping. So I was like, Oh man, let me run over to the sideline. Uh, when I got to the sideline, the trainer popped it back in place and then they took me uh, back to get x-rays and things of that nature. Oh man, that sounds painful. Was it? Did it really hurt? Oh, uh, actually, man, it didn't even hurt until the flight back. So when we got ten thousand feet in the air, that's when it kind of ballooned up, and uh, oh. it was hurting pretty bad on the way back. But no, nah, I really, I, I didn't feel it until we got on the uh, plane ride back. All right, so you sat out like the next three games, right? Yeah. And then you came back. How do you think that injury – I mean, that must have been tough to play throughout the rest of the year, right? Do you think you rushed back or no? Um, I, I probably should have took a little bit more time with it. But, I mean, I mean, I just – I didn't want to see my team, you know, keep losing, especially the games we were losing. We were losing to guys like Furman and, you know, Tulane. And I felt like I could make an impact even though I was still injured. And that probably wasn't the best decision, you know, in retrospect. But in that – would I do it all over again? I probably would just because I love to compete that much and I, I don't like to sit back and not help my team in some type of way. But, yeah, I probably came back a little too soon. You think a lot of the guys kind of quit by the time you got back? Were, were, were no, you really. Oh, and six by the time – what was our record when you got back? 
Uh, so we were owing, I believe, six at that point. We were owing six, yeah. Because I came back the UConn game. Because at one point, that team, yeah, I mean, to go on fit, we were just getting killed the last six games of that season. We weren't even in the games. So I, if you ask me, I think that team kind of quit at the end of that season. Yeah, I, I feel like it was just a lot of lack of execution. And then we also had a lot of young guys on our team. We lost a lot of older guys, a lot of leadership. And uh, we just like, man, we lack execution on a lot of levels. So, I mean, that was that was tough to battle through. Tough to go from, you know, winning the championship to not winning the game at all. That definitely kind of, you know, pushed you through a roller coaster of emotions and all types of things. But uh, fortunately, we were able to bounce back from that my senior year and uh, – Training program. Now. Well, yeah, obviously that's you know it's not a uh, not the most memorable season, but uh, you know from your perspective, what did, I guess what did you take from that season? Obviously, you know I'm sure you still have some fond memories, but sometimes when you go through some bad things in life, you know it's it's the biggest growth moment. So thinking back on that season specifically, what did you learn um, that you've that you've taken with you um, in your life moving forward um, after going through that uh, that 2015 year? Uh, just the biggest thing I always say is that. After that season, I I know what losing looks like because literally I lost every single game. We lost every single week, but you know what losing looked like, so you'll never you'll never accept it ever again. So, I mean, when you when you're winning, like you go from Fiesta Bowl to a conference championship, you're back to back champion. Some things you might take for granted. Some things might get swept under the rug because you're winning. And um, I think 2015 just exposed a lot. I mean, we had a lot of youth again, and we liked the execution. So, I mean, just going into the next offseason, you know what to expect. You know what type of standard to set. And you and you know what not to tolerate uh, from guys on the team so that way you can win. Obviously, towards the end of the year, Coach O'Leary uh, ended up stepping down and, uh, and and stepping away and retiring, um, you know, ultimately. How tough was that for you yeah. personally to see to see him walk away? And how surprised were you when, uh, when, he, when he kind of made the announcement? Um... It was tough because he, he gave me an opportunity. Um, I'm not going to lie. It was a lot of schools that probably would have recruited me as a quarterback and then switched me to wide receiver or safety or something like that. And he gave me a chance as an African-American quarterback to to play this game at the collegiate level, at the D1 level. So I feel, I'm, you know, I'm forever appreciative of him. And he was also, man, he's one of the few football geniuses I got to learn from in my life. And sometimes I wasn't always willing to learn from him because, you know, he had a different way of delivering his message. And, you know, sometimes I just didn't understand it. But, you know, looking back on it, man, I, I probably should have tapped into him more, you know, went into his office a little bit more, talked to him a little bit more because he knew a lot about the game and he knew a lot about life. So um, it, it, it was kind of sad to see him go. But, I mean, that's the way football goes. It's a, it's a volatile game. It's a volatile career for coaches and players. So... I mean, it's sad to see him go, but I hope he's doing well now. Well, so we talked to uh, to Jeff Godfrey earlier this season, and he, he was talking about how how tough it was to play for for Coach O'Leary, how demanding he was, um, and, and how many times you know they they got into uh, to conflicts. What's the, do you have a memory of the worst time that he just chewed you out? That he just he just let you have it for something you did on the field? Man, it's it's more like when is the time he didn't chew me out? <laughs> <laughs> But it was needed. It was needed because he knew the type of guy I was. I'm not. I'm not the type of guy that's all about like you know praise and oh that's an excellent throw, Justin, and all that type of stuff. I love the challenge. So I feel like he was tough on me because he knew that motivated me. He knew that if I thought he counted me out, that it would make me go the extra mile just to prove him wrong and make me play better. So I feel like he just kind of tapped into you know a way to motivate me. But uh, he was definitely. I feel like. I mean, this saying is true. If you can play for Coach O'Leary, you can play for anybody. And I mean anybody in football because he demands that much out of you. So it, it was a fun experience, yet hard and challenging, but definitely needed. Yeah, so there must have been a crazy change when Frost comes in the next year, huh, in 2016? And Oh, yeah. Everything's yeah, different. That, the whole new yeah. offense. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that was – that was uh, they were complete polar opposites. So <laughs> – you got Coach Frost that comes in, man. He's young, cool, laid-back guy. He's not as strict with rules, but, I mean, he's still about the brotherhood. He's still about winning. And, I mean, again, I'm fortunate to say that that was another football genius that I, I got to learn from in my life. I mean, he knew the game in and out. He knew his offense 
in and out. And he, he knows how to scheme a game plan better than a lot of the coaches I've been around. So, I mean, I, I got lucky uh, being around the coaches I got to be around. How hard was it, though? To, I mean, you're in this O'Leary offense for a couple of years already, and now Frost comes in, it's completely different. You have to learn all new schemes and everything. I mean, how hard is that to just switch over like that? Um, fortunately, I have been, you know, starting for a couple of years. So the game of football is – it's only so much you can do. It's just different ways of doing it. So it wasn't like his offense was like a whole brand new offense. It was just a different way of running the offense we already ran. And also, um, and also just the terminology. So like I, like I tell my family when they used to ask me, it just felt like I felt like a freshman all over again. So I just had to get in my playbook even harder, study even more, you know, uh, get up under my quarterback coach, coach, uh, coach Verdusco, who was awesome. Awesome, awesome, awesome guy. And uh, that's how I was able to pick it up as quick as I could. So you were, uh, you were named the starter uh, in 2016, coming out of camp. Uh, so we win the yep. opener against South Carolina State. <clears throat> then we head to Michigan. Uh, so you get hurt midway through the Michigan game. I think it was a hamstring injury. Is that right? Yep, hamstring injury. And, and so you, you sat out the next two games, but then you came back and played against ECU. But at that point, Frost ultimately decides to go with Mackenzie Milton as a starter. Uh, by all accounts, sure you, you mentioned this earlier, you, you know, you remained a team leader and, and a great teammate and, you know, a good mentor to Mackenzie. But how tough was that for you being a, being a senior um, and, and knowing that, uh, that you were going to have to go back and uh, be the backup? Uh, that was tough because you just, you know, your senior season, you just want to be out there with your guys. Like, all of the all of the guys I came in with the uh, the Griffin twins, you know the DJ Killings, the the TJ Mutchisons, the the you know Aaron Evans of the world, uh, Jordan Franks, you know just being out there with those guys, it, it would have been you know fun to play my last season with them, but um it just didn't happen that way. Um, they went with Mackenzie Milton. He definitely, he definitely earned it. He, he was a young guy with a lot of talent, a lot of raw talent. And um, I feel like it was the right decision for the coaches to make for the future of the football team. So it, it was tough. It was a hard pill to swallow. Um, but, I mean, we got through it, and I made sure I encouraged my teammates as much as I could. So if after that season I would have told you that the very next year the team would go, uh, would go undefeated, what would you have said to me? Oh, uh, that was expected. Okay. That was expected. I honestly, <laughs> honestly, I mean, I've never, I've never been the type to have like small dreams. I mean, <laughs> I can show you a message to DJ Killings when he first committed to UCF. I sent him a message on Facebook saying, "We'll win the national championship by the time we leave UCF," and he was like, "I'm with it. Let's go." You know, <laughs> but I mean, I've I've always had these dreams. So when Coach Frost came in, the first day he sat down in the office, he said, "Justin, do you believe?" we can win a conference championship with the talent we have on the team right now. I said, coach, I believe we can win the national championship with the talent we have on this team right now. We just need somebody that can take us there. So, I mean, I never doubted what we had at UCF and what we can do. <laughs> you had a lot of ups and downs, man. Sure. Right? In your whole UCF career. How would you sum it all up? Uh, it was all a testimony, man. It just built a testimony. It was a blessing, really. Because um, it gives like it, it really built built my fortitude. Um, because a lot of the experience I went through made me a tougher man at, at the end of the day. Because uh, even after football is over, you still got to live life. And I feel like a lot of those things that I went through at UCF built me for a, a a better life. So when I go through things in life, it's not even as tough, man. So I mean, it was tough, but it was definitely a testimony that's unique in its own. All right, so a lot of UCF fans were, were excited on Twitter. There's been a lot of talk. Um, so you were in camp with the Atlanta Legends of the New Alliance League. Um, so what was it like to, to get back out in the field? I know you you played some in, a, in the Canadian Football League, but what was it like to get back out in the field, um, you know, near your hometown and uh, just playing football again? Oh, it, it feels amazing. Uh, I'm actually still with the team. I'm just currently on IR. Uh, so I'll be able to play again after four weeks after the first four games. So I'm um uh, I'm still with the squad. I know it doesn't look like that because I didn't show up on the roster, but currently I'm on IR. But I mean, this is this feels great to me. I mean, I'm in my home town, my home state, and uh, I get to be with a group of guys that are all chasing the same thing, man. We hungry for the same dream. So 
I'm just excited to, you know, get back and contribute as fast as I can to the thing. So hey, Justin, isn't it true if they put you on IR that, like, any other team can claim you now? Uh, I'm not sure as far as that how this works in this league. There's a uh, I, I don't know. I feel like there's a lot of things they have to work out with the policy uh, with IR. They, they, you know, it's a new startup league, so they're still figuring things out. But, I mean, that may be a possibility. But all I know as of now is that the first four games that I won't be able to play or anything like that. But um, the first home game, I'll definitely be on the sideline cheering my teammates home and stuff like that. Yeah, so did I you catch you on Orlando. Yeah, did you get a chance to uh, to go to yeah. Orlando this week? <laughs> Oh no, the uh, guys on IR we don't we gotcha. don't even travel like that. So yeah, awesome. Well, but no, nah, man, I, I was I was looking forward to coming back home for that one. I was <laughs> I was looking forward to being back in the bounce house. But hey, I mean things happen. It's the game of football. So well, I'll tell you what. Have you been back to any games in the last couple of years? No, nah, I have not been back to UCF since my pro day, man. Uh, so oh, man. I know it's a uh, it's just a culmination of things. Me being back home, working, training, taking a couple classes and stuff like that. So it's just been tough to get back down there for a game. But I'm always watching. I'm always watching KZ Mac. I got my eyes on them too. Always. I right, come out one, pick a game this year, and come out there. Sure enough, I got to. <laughs> There's no excuses. Well, I'll tell you what. When uh, you know, a lot of UCF fans are really excited when. Uh, when they they found out that you were with the legends and you may be coming back, man. So you certainly have a lot of uh, a lot of folks in Orlando who still root for you, uh, and and we're excited to see you, man. So uh, it, it definitely is uh, definitely is home for you. So definitely make sure you get on back down there, get to the bounce house. You know, and I, I know a lot of UCF people out there waiting to show you some love, man. Sure enough, and I can't wait to show them love. And I hopefully a couple of them make the trip uh, to Georgia State Stadium on March 23rd when we play them again. I'm looking forward to that one because that's when I'll be back. So I'm looking forward to that, man. All right, we'll, we'll, we'll pencil it in March 23rd. So, All right, so yes, Justin, sir. we have a little tradition around here. We end every interview with uh, 10 rapid-fire questions, all right? So these could be questions cool. about football, about life, about food. You never know what you're going to get, man. So are you ready to face the, the 10, um, ten rapid-fire questions? Let's do it. All right, so uh, we talked about this earlier. We know that uh, Coach O'Leary liked to call all you guys ace. What nickname mm-hmm. did you have for Coach O'Leary when he wasn't around? Oh, White Horse. <laughs> White Horse. <laughs> and, and anytime anytime uh, he was coming through the locker room or the weight room, all you hear is White Horse, White Horse, White Horse. So, yeah. <laughs> I've never heard that one. How did that, how did that come about? Who started that? I don't even know, man. I think that was a tradition long before me. I probably shouldn't have leaked it out. But <laughs> yeah, that's what it was, man. White Horse. <laughs> oh, that's great. Is it true that you once knocked on O'Leary's office at 1.30 a.m. to watch game film? Uh, okay, so I didn't knock, but one day I was, you know, walking out to my – it was like the year I wasn't even starting. I was the backup to Blake, and I just wanted to watch the game film after the game. So I was in there until about 1.30, and when I was walking out, he was walking out to his car to grab like an air mattress or something like that so he can sleep in the office and watch film. And he was like, what are you doing? I was like, my bad, Coach. I was back there watching film. And he was like, hmm, okay. And then he just, you know, closed the door and went back in his office. So that was a short exchange. <laughs> All right, so you're, you're from the Atlanta area, uh, which is home to a lot of great hip-hop and rap artists. Who is the best yeah. rapper to come out of the ATL? Oh, man, Andre 3000. Okay, that's a good choice. For sure. For sure. I feel like the up and coming best rapper right now coming out of Atlanta though is uh Jid or J I D. He's definitely the best rapper coming out of Atlanta right now. All right. Do you know him personally? Uh he went to Stevenson. He kinda like family, but if you go listen to his music, you'll see why I'm saying that. He signed to J. Cole, so you'll be hearing him soon. All right, cool. All right. If one of your linemen gets beat and gives up a sack, do they ever apologize to you? Oh, no, nah, they ain't got to apologize. I'm going to probably already be slapping them on the butt or the helmet before they can even get to me. So they ain't got to apologize. It's football. Plays like that happen. So we just got to come back and get the next one. All right, so you spent some time in the Canadian Football League with the Montreal Alouettes. Um, what the heck is an Alouette? I do not know. I believe that is an owl. <laughs> and I believe it's an owl in French. 
Okay. That's what I believe it is. Some type of bird in French. I looked it up. It's some sort of like a cartoon character. I couldn't figure out what it was, too. I didn't know if they ever described to you what the heck an alouette was. No, nah, never. <laughs> <laughs> it could have been a bad word or something. In French. Yeah, I mean, it could have been. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Did you ever um, have a receiver ask you not to throw the ball so hard? And if so, who was it? No one ever asked me not to throw it so hard, but one of the receivers kind of hinted at it. It was actually, uh, <laughs> it was actually Joshua Reeves. He came to me and he was like, "Hey man, you just split my glove." <laughs> he said, "Hey man, you just split my glove open." You know what I'm saying? So he just looked at me and was like, "So, so I was like, okay, I got you, I got you." But yeah, man, I guess I threw it so hard I split his glove in half. <laughs> <laughs> you threw some rockets in there. Yeah. All right, so you you were pre med at UCF, right? Uh, so in the future, yeah. if you become a practicing doctor and you have a patient, uh, you have a waiting room full of patients, and you walk out there, and one of them's wearing a USF shirt, are you gonna make that person wait longer? Absolutely. Okay. Absolutely. Good. If it's a, if it's, if it's a non pressing matter, you know, if they're not, you know, potentially dying, then if they got the common cold or flu, then you know. It may have to wait a little bit longer than everybody else. Okay. That's only fair. That's only fair. That's, that's the way it's supposed to be. I just want to make sure we were all on the same page. <laughs> sure what did they expect anything less? <laughs> all right. If we brought back all the former UCF quarterbacks, let's just say mm-hmm. in the Division One era, so like 96 and on, the last 20 years, 22 years, whatever. Right? Ooh, does, that come, does, that include, would, does that include Culpepper, though? I don't yeah, starting that. from Dante. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah, starting from Dante, let's say. Dante on. Uh-huh. And they had and they had a competition. Who could throw the ball the farthest? How much do you win by? Ooh, I'll probably win by one yard over Dante. It'll be between me, Dante Culpepper, and Jeff Garfield because Jeff Garfield had a rocket too. But I probably win by one yard because Culpepper had a rocket, bro. I can't I can't even sit here and act like he's not a living. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you gotta give it to Dante too. I don't know. Max got a pretty good arm. What do you think? Do you, uh, you think Daryl Mack could put up a competition? No, I can't. He's younger than me too, so I can't even put him in a conversation okay. with us yet. <laughs> okay. Uh, not yet. <laughs> not yet. He got to throw a hail mary first. Okay. <laughs> Fair enough. <laughs> All right. This is this is a true or false question. You ready? True or false? Okay. The first time you saw McKenzie as a freshman, he was so small you thought he might be the kicker. <laughs> false. <laughs> okay. okay. Just I'm just asking. I had to ask. <laughs> <laughs> but 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 seriously, when you when you first saw him, and obviously he's, he's a he's a smaller build. Uh, what did you think yeah. when you first saw him walk in the building? Uh, actually, I was his uh, host when he was getting recruited to UCF, so I was the one that actually like helped bring him in. And uh, I don't know, man. Honestly, you want to know the first thing I thought? I thought, man, uh, this guy is gonna be a great competitor because if you look him in his eyes. Man, the dude had a fire in his eyes like that he wanted to come in and take my spot and that was perfect that's what I wanted <laughs> that's what I wanted because I know he would push me every day and that there was no way I can relax so I mean when you looked into that guy's eyes I can see like that he wanted to you know fight for this position fight to be the greatest at UCF so uh, I liked it I enjoyed it <laughs> okay what's the best football movie ever Oh, best football movie ever. Come on, man. Uh, to me, Friday Night Lights. It's between that and Any Given Sunday. Friday Night Lights and Any Given Sunday. Okay, cool. Friday Night Lights. Okay. That's a good one. Win, let boobies spin. <laughs> <laughs> All right, well, you, you have survived uh, the rapid fire questions, Justin. We appreciate you being, yeah, a, good, we appreciate yeah, you being a good sport on all those. Sure enough, man. All right, well, like I said, man, we appreciate you hopping on, uh, and uh, we'll certainly make sure that uh, we're, we keep an eye out for you with the Atlanta Legends this year. We got March 23rd circle on the calendar. Uh, the Apollos will uh, will make their way up to uh, to Georgia to, uh, to face the Legends. Hopefully we'll see you on the sidelines then. Uh, but uh, obviously we'll, we'll keep rooting for you, Justin, man. We appreciate everything you've done for, uh, for the program. Uh, obviously you are, you are a legend at UCF, man, so make sure you get back to campus soon and, uh, and uh, let people at UCF show you some love, man. I appreciate that, man. You you don't know how much that means to me. So that's good to hear, and I appreciate you guys for having me. Hey, Justin, thanks, man. It was a pleasure. Keep in touch, and it was nice getting to know you. I'm Jeff Allen. Join me each week for unique yet common-sense opinions on sports on the Jeff Allen Sports Talk Podcast. 
We will break down the sports world minus the hot takes with prominent guests and my stable of sports guys. It's sports conversation the way it should be. Search Jeff Allen Sports Talk wherever you get your podcasts or go to JeffAllenSportsTalk.com. This is UCF Athletic Director Terry Mahajri, and in my spare time when I'm not on TikTok, I'm listening to Adam and Mike on the Sons of UCF. Go Knights and charge on. All right, Cows will come uh, come to you in just a moment, Mike. Uh, fun to replay and sort of relive that Justin Holman conversation. Um, I, I, I still remember that interview distinctly uh, for a few different things, but I, one of the other things I remember is you know, the, the story he tells about Blake looking at him and basically saying, like, are you ready to take this thing? Because this thing is about to be yours. Uh, and, and obviously the, the pressure that was on him after UCF had such a great season in 13. Um, and, and say what you will about Justin Holman. He may have had the strongest arm of any UCF quarterback I've ever seen. I mean, that guy could throw it through a brick wall. Obviously, uh, uh, touch and accuracy weren't always his strong suit. Uh, but uh, uh, he definitely had a, a strong arm. And his, his injury in 2015 early in the year, you wonder how that season plays out. Um, you know, if, uh, if he doesn't get hurt, do we continue to go winless? And, uh, and people forget he was the original starting quarterback under the Scott Frost regime as well, uh, got injured and, and gave way to Mackenzie Milton and the rest is history. Uh, so he's kind of got a really interesting UCF arc there cause he was there from 13 to 16. So we saw the good, the bad and the start of the good again. Uh, but overall a good guy, uh, and somebody that I know we were uh, definitely glad to catch up with back then. And hopefully you guys enjoyed hearing from him today. A rocket for an arm. Every single one of his passes, though, were, were no Ryan fastballs. Who was the receiver that told us? I think it was he, Josh he Reese. Josh Reese who told us he ripped his gloves, yeah. <laughs> yeah he, if you could have learned to put a little more touch on some passes, uh, who knows what he would have been capable of. Obviously, the one clunker in UConn, the, the heater gate game, where he, he took ownership for it. He had a bad day that day with a few turnovers. But some good things, and he, he salvaged the season at the very end with the Hill Perriman to bring us a conference championship or share of the conference championship that year. So good player. Um, didn't get a lot of time, obviously, because of some injuries. But, you know, he's definitely a, a good interview. I enjoyed it. And he brought us the white horse. So what else do you want? Nobody else, I think, has brought us anything that can even match the white horse. Nothing matches the white horse, Mike. We are your one-stop shop for farm animals, including Cow of the Week. So, uh, Although I'm not sure a white horse is a farm animal, but somebody will correct me if I'm wrong. Michelle Lakers, who owns – th- she was on the show one, too. Uh, you can hear that at some point. Uh, <laughs> I think she owns We're horses. We're name-dropping a lot. We week. really are. Someone give me a bag for all these names I'm dropping. Uh, but uh, let's drop some Cow of the Week then, Mike. What do, you, what do you say? You lead off, as always. Who you got for Cow? All right. About uh, 20 minutes before we started recording, I saw a thread pop up in the dungeon. Kind of gave me a little anxiety, and I don't know how to feel about it right now. But there's a rumor going around. Somebody called into the Paul Feinbaum show. Paul. And said, and said that our head coach, the guy that we've been praising now for the last couple months, Gus Malzahn, is going to take a leave of absence. Uh, Paul cut the guy off right away and didn't want to hear anything more about it. Is this something we need to be concerned about? And it, if it's not, and if this is just some guy calling in, starting rumors, obviously this guy is an easy cow of the week. But if it is, then who's the cow? I, I don't know. <laughs> is it us? We're falling for it again? For Did we get tricked again? I, I don't know where to go with this. Uh, there is a dead period coming up soon in recruiting. So after these next couple of weeks, he, he has time to go on vacation before he has to come back and get ready for camp and all that stuff. So maybe that guy knows – thinks that he heard something about Malzahn going somewhere on vacation. Maybe that's possible. Um, hopefully there's nothing to it. And if there is nothing to it, then this guy that calls into the Paul Feinbaum show, trying to start rumors about our coach is a big cow trying to do some negative. Um, I wouldn't call it recruiting, but just spreading negative things about our program. Maybe because we're recruiting the way we are and we're going after the Alabama kids and we're going after guys that might've been going to Auburn. Instead they're coming to UCF. That may be this guy's reasoning, but um, cow of the week in my book, at least until he's proven right. And if he's proven right, then I don't know what to do, man. (laughs) I'm going to freak out myself if this is true. (laughs) 
Well, yeah, it certainly is interesting. A, a couple of things about it, if you really want to kind of dissect this conspiracy theory wise, um, you know, why pick Gus Malzahn to call in and, and have this rumor about, right? Like, is, you know, is, is that going to rate on the Paul Feinbaum show? Um, but listen, Feinbaum is where the crazy is going to be crazy. Uh, this is the show where famously the guy called and said he poisoned the trees. Actually, that was true, though. So maybe that's not a good analogy here. Uh, so uh, it, it's hard. It's hard to say. The wording on it is um, uh, sources tell him that uh, uh, somebody in Lee County, which I guess is the county where Auburn's located, not to be confused with Lee County, which is, is in Florida, that uh, Gus is going to have to take a leave of absence from Central Florida. Uh, so have to makes it seem kind of more serious in nature than he's going to, right? I don't know whether what half means something to me, but yeah, that could mean any number of things. Like you said, Mike, there will be a dead period basically for a, about a full month here. Um, so you got to hope this is a rumor, Mike. You got to hope that this is either way, though, this is not how this should come out. If this is indeed true. And I get that. Listen, we're a show where we're on here all the time doing reckless speculation about all kinds of things. And if we heard rumors, I'm sure we would run with the two because that's what you want to do. Um, but th- even if this is in some form or fashion, there's any accuracy here. That's not the way this should come out. Um, so hopefully there's nothing serious here, Mike. Hopefully this is a cow of the week that will stand that this guy is, uh, is is not uh, credible and just made this up for reasons not only to him um but but who who knows um you know people make up strange stuff all the time and hopefully that's the case here but i mean i guess let's just hope nothing's wrong with with gus it seems like everyone's kind of poo-pooing this and saying no he's energized have you seen him he bought this house everything is okay but i guess you never know what's going on in someone's life till you really know yeah no we don't know <laughs> we know nothing he, You'd see your friends on Facebook posting pictures of their family, this and that. And then the next thing you know, the, the people are getting divorced or whatever. And you say, what the heck happened? <laughs> I wow. mean, hopefully yeah. that is not the case here. I mean, things right now look rosy and everything's going great for UCF and Gus. And it's a happy marriage, but who knows if something's going on behind the scenes we don't know about. Hopefully not. But you, you mentioned the, the guy that called in about the trees. That's one of the funniest things you'll ever hear. <laughs> <laughs> the guy incriminates himself on the radio. And then when Paul tells him, you know, that, that's a crime, you could go to jail for that. And say, what now? That's <laughs> 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 always got me. So uh, hopefully nothing to worry about here. And we, we can move on from this. But keep your eyes open. You never know. Sometimes things like this turn out to be true. And then, you know, I don't know where we go. We start all over from here. We got a T1 a flat situation. I mean, it, listen, it was a have to take a leave of absence. It didn't say for how long, right? It could be, you know, for two weeks, could be for a month, could be for, you know, who knows. Uh, so, you know, I, I guess we'll, we'll see. Hopefully this is this is all much ado about nothing. And this guy is Cal of the Week for coming on, spreading a false rumor, and not Cal of the Week for coming and breaking a, a secret of something he shouldn't have shared. Uh, but uh, either way, something to monitor. Obviously, we'll keep you posted if we hear more um, from that perspective. Mike, my Cal of the Week, we've been doing this show for so long now, 137 episodes now. I don't know if I've used this one before, so stop me if I have. My Cal of the Week is... Um, so um, you we're all probably used to, you know, getting those scams that you get via email, right? Somebody uh, overseas won the lottery and they want you to claim the ticket, right? Uh, I'm sure we all get some of these like random emails. Uh, we get all the phone calls. The, uh, the iPhone's getting smarter now. I get spam risk or spam as likely as my, um, as my, my calling uh, 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 screen update when, when the phone rings. But Mike, I'm starting to get inundated with, with now spam text messages. Are you, are you getting any of these? Am I the only one getting spam text messages? Um, yeah, I get a bunch here and there. I get my FedEx package is, has been a facility. Click this link. Your Amazon account password has been compromised. Click here. New series on Netflix. Get it for free. Click here. I mean, I'm getting those once a day, Mike. And while we were recording, I got I got one right here that I'm going to read to you guys out loud. Um, and this is from a phone number. It's got a real phone number, obviously. And it says, hey, this is Michelle. You sent me your number on Snapchat last night. I sent you something since you're so sweet. Click here. And it's a link, Mike. Ooh. Now, a couple of things. I don't have Snapchat, so I don't I don't know uh, what this could be. I don't know Michelle. Uh, seems very friendly though, based on this picture or uh, on this on this message here. But Michelle wants me to click this link, Mike, and that's what that's what you know is going to work. Here's my question for you: How many people out of ten do you think fall for that? Like, if you had to guess right now, out of ten people, ten guy, ten red blooded American males get that text message right now. How many of those ten are clicking that link? Well, I mean, fall for it as in think that this is an actual woman that has interest in them or just click the link because they want to see what, click, what's click going on. Click the link. Here. Actually, click the link. Uh, you know, click the link, maybe 50%. Wow. It's just curiosity. You didn't click it? I did not. No. 
<laughs> you want me to forward it to you and you can you can, you can update me <laughs> send it over send it over <laughs> i'll take a peek for you um, I, I often wonder what the what the um what the return on investment ratio is to make these scams worth it for people right because they got to be sending out a bunch of these messages through whatever system that they have right how many clicks do they have to get for it to be worth it for them to, to be worth their value if you're not spending a ton of time i guess you know one or two probably works for you but the the amount of volume of people like calling me telling me about my car warranty or you know emailing me and telling me that my password's been compromised click here to, to get it fixed uh, the amount of spam that it goes through just makes you wonder how many people i get to call all the time to get like the voicemail that says like your social security number has been compromised if you have a warrant out for your arrest if you don't call within five minutes i personally love those calls mike whenever they come i can't wait to answer them i love to talk to people i love to be like oh my god what did i do wrong like oh, was this about that one thing uh, and they typically get them to, to hang up on me um but you got to wonder how many of these have to be successful before for this business to really be worth it for the scammer you know because i feel like there's a good ratio where you have to hit that number to make it worth your while yeah i mean who knows there's a whole you know there's they they've got to get enough suckers or else they wouldn't be doing it so they must be successful somehow um same thing with our facebook account so i started the facebook account to promote this show i gotta tell you every once in a while we get some friend requests that uh, <laughs> obviously oh are not real people <laughs> oh boy <laughs> <laughs> So the minute I accept the request, two seconds later, I'm getting a message. Hey, how are you? Come check out this and click on here. Uh, so <laughs> I, I don't know, man. I don't know who's running these things. Obviously, it's just all computerized stuff. My phone, I was able to set up my phone where anytime there was a number I didn't recognize, it, it just went straight to voicemail. I didn't get those for a while. And then, you know, sometimes you you have to accept some of those calls. So I had to take that off, but I think I'm going to go back to doing that. I wonder if there's a way for a text message. You can block text messages that your phone doesn't recognize. Well, you can, uh, you can go block a number once it texts you. Um, but that's the problem is sometimes that we get random texts from people from the show that like, or I'm interacting with, I don't have their number program, but they have my number. And so they'll text me like, yeah, I can do the show this week. And so I wouldn't want to like, you know, cut off all that stuff because I do get a, a, a number of messages from people I don't have maybe embedded in my contacts just yet. So, that's where it gets a little tricky on uh, on some of these. But Michelle really wants me to click this link. I'm not going to do it, Michelle. I apologize in advance. If anybody's clicked this link, though, and, and you don't have to you know, confess a lot, maybe send us a DM and tell us what happened when you did, just because I'm curious more than anything. Like, what do, what do you get off these links if you're actually clicking them? Um, and what does the bad guy get to? Because, again, I got to wonder, is this game, uh, how much is this really worth, you know? I don't know. But you know who has this down to the science? Bed, Bath & Beyond. Yes. I get a text message from them, like, every week about some sale or whatever um you know i had used it in the past but i haven't been to bed bath and beyond now probably in a couple of years so i don't know i still get the text messages i tell you what no one's got it for, the marketing figured out better than fanatics because i probably get like four emails from fanatics a day on, on any and all sales that they have too i think about one shirt there for one time for i think it was the peach bowl championship shirt i bought from fanatics and i they probably get like five or six emails a day yep i get a lot of those too the UCF uh, website, right? Yeah, yeah. Just, just ton of, just ton of email. And all, they, and, I, and they work, Mike. Because every time I see them, I'm like, oh, hmm, polos are on sale. And I think about it <laughs> yeah. every time. So it's working for me. I'm not gonna lie to you. I gotta tell you, I had a couple things in my cart the other day, and I just never pulled the trigger on them. The, I, they're dirt cheap right now. The 2017 conference championship hat after we beat Memphis, uh, the first time. The white hat. It's on sale now for five dollars and sixty cents. I was about to buy it. That and the two thousand eighteen hat, which was on sale for like eight dollars. But I was just trying to get enough things so I could get the free shipping because it just buying those two hats, I was still would have had to pay like twenty dollars in shipping. Mm, okay. So so I never ended up doing it. Maybe one day I'll, I'll go through with it. But uh I, I need a couple new hats, I think. Well, we have some UCF hats that are available that you can uh you know. That's true. You can always wear that. Or we can hand, we can we haven't sent hats on a while. We should figure out a way to send some more hats out here as the summertime rolls around, Mike. And we should find a lot of time to do a lot of things around here. Uh, don't know what all that stuff is, but obviously, whatever it is, you guys are more than welcome to come along for the ride. Again, all you need to do is click some buttons, subscribe or follow the podcast wherever you do that at. Find us all social media stuff. We're available everywhere. Uh, make sure you check us out Thursday nights, Mike, with Trace Trelko, the Sons of UCF live show. Uh, this past week, we had Ryan Schneider on. The week before that, we had Carlos McCants on. Uh, the week before that, I think we had Renaya Jones on. Uh, so you never know who's going to pop up on the Sons of UCF live. So you're going to want to check that out each and every Thursday. It's an hour long. 
We uh, will also uh, give you the audio version the next day, and you can always watch the replay. Uh, you can watch on our YouTube channel, which you can find on YouTube, or by going to our website at two nightsmedia.com. Uh, and, uh, and, and that's what we got for you. That's 137. That's in the books, Mike. How does it feel? We have, we're almost at 140. I don't know if that's a milestone situation for us. Yeah, I guess we're almost at 150. Uh, we could be at 150 by the time football season starts, which is pretty cool. That's right. Yeah. I was just going to say that by the time we kick off the season, that, that's a big uh, milestone for us. Uh, and speaking of those hats, we got to keep a couple of those for our big tailgate party that we're going to have for the, the opener. Well, we have our celebrity boxing matches. Let's not forget about those. Mm. And I have I have gotten some uh, messages from people that are that do want to participate in this tailgate, whether we have the boxing matches or not. <laughs> <laughs> but people do want to hang out with us before the, the uh, Boise State game. So let's figure that out. If if you have the parking spots and you want to set it up at your spot, free hat. How's that? Oh, free hats. Look at and that. Then, and then we'll we'll figure out who's bringing what from there, brother. Time's ticking now. We're one week further in. We fair. still don't ha- have a, a fair plan. So yeah. let's get moving on this. I mean, you some volunteers. We'll get moving. We'll get volunteers and uh, we'll keep or, you updated. Or, hold on, there's more. Or, or I thought of another idea. Just now? Just well, this, this is live or, or this is unfiltered, Mike? Instead of us having our own tailgate, mm-hmm. how, how about everybody just tells us where they're tailgating? Uh, me and you, we'll just hop around tailgate to tailgate and we'll compare. We'll compare. Who has the best tailgate? Ah, Jesus. This way we get to eat and drink everybody's stuff okay. <laughs> as we get closer to the stadium. How do you think about that? Well, I, we need, I need transportation. We need like a golf cart. We need something to whisk us around. You know what I mean? No, nah, we'll just walk. I mean, we'll, we'll do a spot somewhere in the memory mall. We'll do, we'll do one over in the uh, baseball lot. Then we'll have one over in E6 or whatever. We'll, we'll try three or four different tailgate parties and, and make a contest of it. So it's kind of like Whoever a- has the best tailgate? Gets a hat. So basically, we're we're on we're on like a pub crawl at this point, right? We're just crawling from from tailgate to tailgate. Exactly. All right, that could work. Yeah, that could work too. Uh, all, all those are good options. All those are things that uh, we'd love to be able to put together at some point as we finalize our plans. We are what? Uh, what did I just see? Seventy three days away from kickoff. I think I saw Sam Jackson's picture today. Uh, so seventy three days away from kickoff. If I saw that right on on Twitter. So not a uh, not a long ways to go from that at all. We are almost there, folks. Obviously, Mike and I will try as best we can to keep you entertained through these summer months here, as uh, recruiting period is going to come to an end. Uh, it's going to be kind of uh, kind of dull there for that June ish, July ish area. But we'll figure out a way to keep you entertained. Make sure you uh, you just tag along for the ride. Sons of UCF will be here on the pod. We'll be here on the live show. And uh, everybody, uh, have a fantastic week. And we will talk to you all on Thursday. Until then, go Knights. Charge on.